Good morning, Gypsy. How are you? Yeah, good. How are you going? Yeah, good. I just finished doing the sound check on my Lazar's presentation. Um, so I thought I'd check in with you just to see everything was all good. Yeah. Um, do I sound good? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you just fine. Just great. Perfect. All right. Welcome to Boswell as well from UBS. Hi. Hey. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. Good. I'll be the um, the strong voice, uh, strong silent type in the background, just making sure all of the, the plates keep spinning during these events. So, uh, if at any time you have any tech issues or anything like that, by all means, send me a message. Uh, thanks. Easy. All good. You've been crushing it, Gyps. I've been listening to um, yesterday. I got to listen to. Uh, I had further math in my right ear, and I had uh, <laughs> math methods in my left ear. And uh, believe it or not, I spent the rest of the night in the corner rocking and crying into a pillow. Um, that's not that bad. <laughs> I had 12 hours worth of recordings in six hours. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Um, I, only, I only got about three quarters of it, though. <laughs> that's all good. Easy. All right. Um, 10 o'clock. Show's yours. Cool. Enjoy. Alrighty, hello everyone. Um, my name is Gypsy, and yeah, we're going to be starting this Skyline Revision series in Specialist Mathematics. Uh, but before that, I just wanted to introduce our volunteers from UBS. Um, do you guys want to just say hello? Uh, your microphone's muted. Oh, there you go. Hello, everyone. I'm Jobin. Sorry. <laughs> and Bozal, did you want to say hello as well? Oh, that's okay. <laughs> we just said hi before anyway. Um, cool. So uh, just before we get started, just some like uh, little uh, uh, little some little notes about some like uh, what the volunteers are here for. Um, a lot of the time during my presentation, I won't be able to just look at the chat and respond to your questions straight away. So if you have any concerns or issues, I definitely recommend um, messaging either Boswell or Jamin and they can kind of interrupt me anytime during the conversation. Also during, um, during our Q&A sessions, uh, hopefully they can help me out a little bit. Um, cool. So just looking at the agenda for today, uh, in the first 10 minutes, we're gonna be going through just, just the agenda and kind of introductions and kind of, I mean, we've done a lot of the introductions now, but I have an about me slide and we need to talk about some Zoom etiquette, et cetera. We're gonna go through each of the area of studies so functions and graphs, algebra, calculus, vectors, and mechanics. Um, and then we're going to go through, in the last 10 minutes, just kind of understanding VCAR study design, especially the amendments, um, the amendments that were made uh, due to the coronavirus in 2020. We'll also be doing at the end of each uh, area of study, uh, if we have time, but especially during these kind of 10 minute breaks, we'll be answering any questions you have. Um, and that is questions you have on Mentimeter. So we're using, see if at the bottom it says, ask me anything at menti.com. Um, if you put that in your browser and you check in the code, then uh, what you can do, you'll, uh, you'll be kind of, there'll, there'll be an interface in front of you where you can just ask questions. You can upvote each other's questions to see, um, to see which ones are most popular or most relevant. And um, yeah, I'll be answering those. There could be questions about, you know, specific content like, um, what is the best way to interpret maybe vectors or how can, what is the geometric interpretation of vector projections or something like that? Or it can be more kind of broad questions like, uh, you know, what's it like um, after high school or maybe like, how did you study for mathematics? Or maybe, um, you know, something more specific to the UBS volunteers. So I'm still studying um, and I also don't really have a, I mean, my job is tutoring, but, you know, you could ask questions like, uh, what's it like, you know, working full-time, et cetera. Cool. Now, just a one thing on Zoom etiquette. Uh, uh, the first top point is to be present throughout the session and have your mobiles mute. Um, this won't be an issue if your Zoom is muted anyway. Try to close down any tabs, any programs you're not using to save on bandwidth and distractions. Um, we just want to give you the best presentation we can. And if it means uh, if your internet is not is pretty shaky, you might get a 
kind of pixelated screen when I'm sharing my screen and I'm doing practice problems. So to avoid that, try to just close down any tabs. Um, again, try to stay on mute when you're not talking. Uh, that just helps the flow of the presentation. Um, keep your video turned off. This is just because uh, of that second dot point. We want to kind of save on bandwidth. We don't want anyone to have a bad time. Um, and again, use Mentimeter to ask questions. So this is at the bottom, ask me anything at menti.com. Perfect. So I just wanted to start uh, by uh, introducing myself a little bit. I was actually a former Skyline student from Northern Bay College, Karai. So that's in Geelong. Um, Skyline came to Geelong a couple of years ago and uh, actually was part of the pilot program. Um, I'm studying a Bachelor of Science in Pure Mathematics at the University of Melbourne. So that's within the Mathematics and Statistics faculty, uh, but just a bit more specialised. Uh, I kind of really like Pure Mathematics. Uh, I kind of like maths for the sake of maths rather than its applications to science. Um, but if you're more interested, if you're interested in kind of what Pure Mathematics is or maybe how I interpret it, you can always ask me a question again on Mentimeter. Um, I scored a 45 in methods and a 40 in specialist math. So that's uh, the top two and 8% of the state respectively. Um, but again, I also study mathematics at uni for the past two years. So uh, I think that experience maybe supersedes it. Um, I aspire to become an academic someday. So at the moment I am uh, lecturing uh, with Skyline, but I'm also lecturing with uh, ATAR notes. Um, and so I teach specialist math one, two actually at ATAR notes, but um, with Skyland, I also teach 3-4, and that's why I'm doing this presentation today. Uh, I'm really, in, I mean, in terms of my hobbies, I'm really into playing guitar and playing the bass guitar and drums into that kind of funky sound. Um, I'm also really into philosophy, and I kind of uh, use philosophy and mathematics very, uh, I mean, uh, they, they link very much to each other, especially when we get to high-level mathematics. Uh, but yeah, this just an interesting fact at the bottom. Despite loving maths, I don't really like the sciences. So I'm not really into physics or bio or chemistry, um, which is maybe for, to a high school student, uh, really surprising. Um, but yeah, cool. Uh, and this picture on the bottom right is just after my exams um, for, I mean, you guys, I guess you could call it schoolies. Um, I, uh, asked, I mean, my friend uh, traveled in Indonesia. And so this is us in the Sumatran rainforest. Um, in Bukit Lawa. Um, yeah, and I guess just one more thing I just wanted to say is uh, I graduated two years ago, 2018. So um, all this knowledge is still fresh. Um, yeah, hopefully I can answer a lot of these uh, specific VCE questions. Um, again, just before I start, I just want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land we are gathered on today. I pay my respects to the elders past and present where they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across the nation. Alrighty, so we're going to move on to our first area of study, but um, there's just one more thing I wanted to mention before we get into the content. The way I'm structuring this presentation will be a revision of each area of study, but not a comprehensive revision of each area of study. So I won't be going through every single dot point in the study design, um, I'll touch on what that means if you don't know it um, at the end of the presentation. But I'll, I've picked out, you know, what I think is maybe the, uh, the things students struggle with the most, slash you maybe the things that appear in the exam the most. So, I mean, as you can see for area study one, I'm going through rational functions and trigonometric formulas. Um, and this revision session will be centered around um, the first exam. That doesn't mean it's not applicable for the second exam, but, um, the way uh, you kind of write, the way you set up your uh, questions, the way you use your theory in the first exam is almost identical that, um, to the second exam, ex except for the second exam, you've got your calculator. Um, now, it's a bit hard to share my calculator and stuff like that over the screen. I don't have the programs and stuff like that. And also, um, I do think that focusing on exam one, especially, um, can teach you a lot about the exam. Um, one other thing I wanted to say, so um, if you came to my methods uh, presentation yesterday, you would have saw that at the bottom left, um, so if we look at a sample example question, exam question, at the bottom left, I sometimes said, you know, only 16% of the state got it right, only 8% of the state got it right. Now, I haven't done that with this presentation. It's a, it's a bit different. So like um, some of the, some of the, um, 
some of the questions I'll be doing are very, very hard. So there's a, a question, for example, when we talk about um, calculus that only about 8% of the state got right, or maybe even 2% or something like that. But um, for example, this question on uh, trigonometric formula, um, about half of the state got it right. So it's just a mix. I didn't want to get distract you guys with the um, exact percentages, but um, nevertheless, all these are very, very important concepts to know. All right, so that brings me um, to the start of the first area of study, functions and graphs. We'll begin our mathematical endeavor with an introduction to the rational function. And this is a function of the form p of x is equal to f of x over g of x. Now, I could be a bit more rigorous and say that f of x and g of x are actually polynomials. And we can say it's defined when g of x is not equal to zero. And hopefully that's, um, that feels really natural to you guys. We don't want the denominator, denominator, we don't want to divide by zero. Cool. Now in specialists, we are, under, we are expected to understand how to graph these functions. But luckily we can tackle these using a very formulaic approach. Now, what I mean by formulaic is a lot of times, um, especially uh, when you're doing high level mathematics, so specialist, maybe the harder bit of methods, it may, maybe it feels like that you have to have a spark of inspiration to be able to do a question. Maybe, you know, sometimes we call it intuition. Um, and every, anytime we don't need an intuition, which is most of the time, actually, it's, it's very, very um, beneficial for us because we can tackle the, each question the same way every time. So I'm going to teach you this very formulaic approach to approaching um, to studying rational functions. So it's as follows. The first thing you want to do is factor the denominator of p of x. So remember our p of x is, our, um, we can write it as f of x over g of x. And if we're factoring the denominator of p of x, we're factoring this bit, the bottom. The reason why we'd want to do that is because we can solve this denominator for zero. And we can only really do that after we've factored it. These are going to get us the vertical asymptotes. So these are these um, lines that are vertical. <laughs> Next, and this is what people struggle with the most. We want to find horizontal asymptotes. And we can do this by understanding the graph at extreme values. And that's plus or minus infinity. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so the way I'm going to discuss finding horizontal asymptotes is through limits, which you would have hopefully learned maybe in methods one, two, especially one, two, but I understand it's been a while. Um, another way, and this is just the way that I do it. And, you know, I think this is a, a good way of doing it. Um, I won't, uh, a lot of these concepts, I won't go in depth in uh, kind of explaining, um, but yeah. So if you don't know what that means, I mean, you can always ask a question Mentimeter. Maybe I can go through it a bit. Uh, I can go through the limit process a bit longer. Or, um, I mean, if you're a Skyline student, you can come to my classes on Special 34. Cool. And the last thing you want to do to graph a rational function is you want to identify any intercepts. So four-step approach, factorize, vertical asymptotes, horizontal asymptotes, and intercepts. And obviously, if you want to add maybe a five, is to actually graph it. Alrighty. So again, the best way to um, understand what we're doing is to jump right in. Um, cool. So I'm just going to tab to my OneNote. And as you can see, um, I've got the exact same question just up here. Alrighty. Let me just, um, I just want to change the squares a bit. There we go. Um, alrighty. Now the question asked, to sketch the graph of this rational function here on the axis provided below. We wanna label any asymptotes with their equations and any intercepts with their coordinates. And that's already well and good because we incorporated um, finding asymptotes and intercepts inside of our method. Now, the first thing I actually wanna notice, uh, wanna, wanna point out before we get into the solution is this is worth four marks. Now, that's a lot of marks when it comes to an exam one question. So if you have the ability to sketch these graphs, um, it, it, it will pay off. So it may be worth kind of maybe making up a rational function, maybe just having a polynomial, let's go x squared plus 3x plus 9 divided by 3x squared, uh, no, let's go 3x uh, cubed plus 2x. 
and then saying, oh, will I be able to graph it? Or maybe if you don't want to make your own, you can Google it, et cetera, et cetera. But again, just it's worth a lot of mark. So it's important to pay attention and learn how to do this. So remember the first step of my method is we want to take the graph and factorize the denominator. So we can look at f of x and we can say that f of x is equal to, let me just write the same thing down, x plus one on x squared minus four. And to factorize the denominator, hopefully you can recognize this as the difference of two squares. That's gonna be x plus two, x minus two. Now, if you didn't recognize that, I'm just gonna write the formula up here. a squared minus b squared is equal to a plus b, a minus b. And this is definitely a very, very handy formula you wanna have in, just in your head. So we've got these, and now we can solve for our vertical asymptotes by solving the denominator for zero. So we can write vert asymptotes. We can write something like, um, we can write something like x plus two, x minus two is equal to zero. So x equals negative two and x is equal to two. Cool, so we've gone through our uh, factorization, we've gone through our vertical asymptotes, and now we wanna go for our horizontal asymptotes. So just let's write horror asymptote. No, I'm gonna do this, oh, sorry, I'll just write asym. Now I'm gonna do this uh, through limits. So I'm gonna write, what, um, write it formally and then I'll try to explain it. So I'm gonna write the limit as x approaches infinity, and then I'm gonna write this f of x down. So this is x plus one on x squared minus four. And we wanna understand what does that equal to? Um, now, when we're talking about limits, and we're talking about especially uh, dividing uh, limits of a rational function, we wanna understand how fast the top grows compared to how fast the bottom grows. And so what do I mean by that? Well, we can see if we plug in numbers to X, we're gonna get say, um, so if we plug in the number one to X plus one, so let's just mark this by yellow. Um, we're gonna get at X is equal to one, at X equals two, three, et cetera. We're gonna get, you know, let's plug in one to this. So we get two. Let's plug in two to this, we get three. Plug in four, uh, three to this, we get four. As you can see, as we plug in what X is, I mean, it's growing, growing pretty slowly. But if we look at the bottom one, um, let's chuck in X squared minus four. I mean, at the start, X squared minus four, that's negative three. Okay, it's much smaller than the X plus one, but let's plug in the two, we're at zero. And let's plug in three, we're at five. And let's keep going a little bit longer. Let's plug in four, we're at 12. Plug in five, we're at 21. And it's growing pretty fast, but this one will just grow kind of one by one. So eventually, because X, let me just, I didn't want to raise that. Eventually, because X squared is on the denominator, X squared always is gonna grow super fast, way bigger than X. And so that what that means, if the denominator is growing super, super fast, that means we're dividing things into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller amounts. And so the horizontal asymptote, I mean, this limit will be zero. So what that means, I mean, geometrically is as we go, if we look at our graph here, and let me maybe change color. Um, our, we don't know if it's coming from the bottom or the, the top, but it's always gonna approach zero. It's gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets to zero. Now, now I kind of drew this table out. Let me just rub that out. But the way I think is, um, the way I think now, I mean, in general, is I look at X squared and I look at X and I'm thinking X squared is always gonna be kind of bigger than X. Um, so this is gonna be zero. So I know this is a tough topic, um, limits, even though um, we were supposed to have learned it maybe in year 11, but um, yeah, I think it's worth kind of revising. In the same way, if we look at the limit as x approaches negative infinity, we're also, um, of this function here, we're also gonna get zero. 
And so that means we've got this asymptote at y is equal to zero. Um, so while we have all these asymptotes, let's try to put them in. So this is this first asymptote. That's going to be our y is equal to zero. We can plug in our asymptotes at plus or minus two. So x is equal to two and x is equal to negative two. Alrighty. Um, and the next thing I said to uh, do when sketching the graph is we want to find out what our intercepts are. So let's have a look at um, our y-intercept. That's going to occur at f of 0, which is just 0 plus 1 on 0 squared minus 4. So that's just negative a quarter. For our x-intercepts, I mean, we can just look at the numerator because the denominator is going to divide out. We're looking at x plus 1 is equal to 0. And so x is equal to negative 1. So we can plug those into our graph too. X is equal to negative one is right here. And X is equal, um, uh, Y is equal to negative quarter. That's about, so that's one, that's about here. So let me try to label those. That first one is going to be um, negative one zero. And the second one is gonna be uh, zero negative a quarter. Perfect. Now, this, this first, this middle kind of part of the graph, we can actually already sketch. And I claim that it's going to look something like this. We know it has to pass through those um, two points. And since we have those asymptotes there, they have to kind of, um, they have to kind of hug the asymptotes at some point. And so we kind of have it kind of uh, uh, hugs them on the ends. Now, the next, the last thing we want to do, so I kind of didn't put this um, in, the, uh, in the methodology because sometimes it's a bit different, but we can see that we haven't filled in this section or this section, or it could be this section, or it could be this section. We haven't filled in those sections. And to fill in those sections, we have to find out, well, uh, we, like, we have to find out which section the graph is actually in. So um, I'm gonna, uh, I claim that the graph can only be in either this section or this section at, on the left-hand side, or it can be on this section or this section in the right-hand side. And that's because we can't have something here. So say, we can't say uh, our graph can't be here and here at the same time, because then it wouldn't be a function as it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. And so what I want to find out is which quadrant, um, which out of these two quadrants is my graph in and which out of two, these two quadrants is my, like, my second kind of half the graph in. And to do that, what I'm going to do is just plug in um, numbers. So let's plug in a number that's over here. We can plug in this number three, for example. So let me just section this off and I want to find f of three. So let me just zoom out so you can see what f is. f of 3, that's just going to be 3 plus 1 on 3 squared minus 4. And all we need to know is, is that going to be a positive number or a negative number? And um, I think it's pretty easy to see that this is just going to be a positive number. Again, we can check f of negative 3. That's going to be negative 3 plus 1 on negative 3 squared minus 4. And um, likewise, it's easy to see that this one is actually a negative number. So we look at where three is and we know, ah, the graph has to be in here because it's positive. So we can get rid of that quadrant. And where negative three is, we can see, well, that's gonna be negative. So it's gonna not be in this one, but here. And finally, to finish off our graph, we can just draw it hugging um, the asymptotes. So it's gonna look like this. And then for this one, it's going to look like this. And so finally, we've finished off our graph. Um, let's get rid of these negative three. Cool. And we have a beautiful graph like that. We just double check we've labeled all the asymptotes correct. We've um, sketched all the intercepts with their coordinates. That's all good too. Um, so yeah.
Um, we did everything correct. We should be happy. And so that's worth four marks. Now, um, I, I took it very, very slow so I could explain all these processes to you. But once you've done it a couple of times, you can do these questions really quickly. All right. Again, if you have any questions, just uh, go on to Mentimeter. All right. So we've done that question. Now, um, just bear with me for two seconds. I just wanted to take a picture of this agenda so I know if I'm good for time. Cool. So we've got 10 minutes and I can explain the last topic. Perfect. So we've gone through graphing rational functions and now we're going to be talking about um, the true kinometric formulae. Now, again, I've skipped a lot of things. For example, you need to know how to graph the secant function, cosecant function, cot, tan inverse, sine inverse. Um, but just for the sake of time today, and I wanted to get a well-rounded presentation, um, I've omitted those sections. So the next thing I'll cover is making sure we're familiar with different trigonometric formulae and how to use them. See below is an excerpt of the formula sheet for specialist mathematics. Now, it's got a lot of great formula, so you should use them. Uh, that doesn't mean you should memorize them because they're already here, but we should know how to use them. For example, you know, if we get a weird um, angle, we should know that maybe we can decompose it into its constituent parts. Maybe we can say it's X plus Y um, or X minus Y. Now this might be, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, how much you guys have done um, using our kind of addition and subtraction angle formulas, but we can have a go at looking at pi on 12. And can we write that as uh, angle we know, subtract an angle we know? For sure. Um, and if you know what the answer to this one is, um, yeah, you can post it in the comments or you can, I don't know, you should, you should be able to recognize these things. Um, and if you don't, just have a practice. Now we've got, um, so we've got these, this section, which is full of, yep, that's precisely right, Ryan. We've got this pi and three minus pi and four. Now, uh, we've got that whole section that's just full of what we call our compound angle formula, or let's actually call it addition slash uh, subtraction angles, angle formula. Um, at the bottom here, we've got our double angles. Oops. Uh, double angle. And at the top here, we've got what we call our Pythagorean. So we should be familiar with how to use all of these. Cool. Um, alrighty then. So let's have a look at our next question. Now we want to, we see that given cosine X minus Y is equal to three on five, we need to find what cosine X plus Y is. So actually, um, I'm gonna show you this solution in just a section, second, but I'm gonna give you maybe one or two minutes to just have a read and see how we would tackle this. Have your formula sheet handy, just so you know um, uh, what formulas to use. And if you don't, just, just have a go. Um, just have a go plugging some stuff in. So yeah, cool. Um, I'll give you one minute to read this till 10.28 and then we'll go through it together. Um, I'm just going to have my camera up. I'm just going to plug in my charger. I'll be right back. All right, cool. Um, perfect, I'm back and it's 1028. So hopefully you've had a read of this quickly, had a read of um, what the formulas are and hopefully maybe you have in your mind what you would do in during the exam. I'll tell you what I'll do, I, I'm gonna do. It might not be the most efficient solution, but it kind of maybe will show you um, the process in which I'm thinking. So the first thing I see is this cosine x minus y is equal to three on five. 
And what I want to do with that information is somehow um, I want to get that into more manageable information so I can find what cosine of x plus y is. So um, actually what, what might be um, uh, useful is what is actually cosine x plus y? So let's write that down. Cosine x plus y. And we can actually go straight through to our formula sheet and write down what it is. So that's just going to be cosine x, cosine y, minus sine x, sine y. All right, perfect. So we know what this is. And we need to find something about this cosine x, cosine y. And we need to find something about this sine x, sine y. All right. So let's see if this cosine x minus y will help us. Cosine x minus y is equal to cosine x cosine y plus sine x sine y. We know that's equal to 3 on 5. Now, cool. We can see it's, it's looking a bit familiar. The top um, half we've got a minus, the bottom half we have a plus. Um, Okay, we'll decompose that into uh, two bits of information. And the last bit we need to decompose is this 10x, 10y is equal to two. So what does that even mean? 10x, 10y. Well, um, that's just gonna be sine x, sine y, divided by cosine x, cosine y. And that's gonna be equal to two. So what this is actually telling us is, so this just implies that sine x, sine y is equal to two cosine x, cosine y. Cool. And um, we wanted to find, well, we wanted to find either sine x or sine y, but I'm gonna write um, cosine x, cosine y is equal to half, sine x, sine y. All right, easy. And so if we look back at this um, formula, uh, this equation, which I'll call number one, we can say, we can now write that as cosine x, uh, well, let's not write it, cosine x. Instead of writing cosine x, we can write now this half sine x, sine y, plus this sine x, sine y. is equal to, well, three on five. Um, we can, this just means now a half plus a one, that's just gonna be three on two. Um, that's gonna be equal to three on five now. And so we get this implies that our sine x sine y is equal to two on five. Finally, what we can say is our cosine x, oops, our cosine x plus y, which we had um, earlier, is going to be our cosine x, cosine y. So what is that? That's going to be a half sine x, sine y. Minus sine x, sine y. And that's just going to be one half multiplied by this two fifths that we found minus, well, two fifths. And we get here negative one fifth as our final answer. Now, I've kind of gone uh, um, a little bit out of space, but as you can see, I've been skipping a lot of lines. So hopefully not in the exam, you have plenty of space. And if you don't, I mean, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you will. So that shouldn't be a problem. All right, so we've gone through trigonometry. And that brings us to 1032. Okay, so we've gone a little bit over, but that's okay. Um, oh no, we haven't gone a bit over. We have a couple minutes, 1032. Um, we have three minutes to answer maybe some questions we've had on centimeter. All right, so let's look if we've gotten any questions, specialist. questions. Perfect. So either I've done a really good job or a really bad job. Um, but that's okay. Um, the bulk of the question time anyway will be at 11 o'clock. 
So if you have any questions at all, how did you find the shape of the rational function? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. So we want to understand, uh, this is what I meant. Let me just scroll up. We always know that the, um, the function is going to hug the asymptotes. And by hug, is it's always going to tend towards an asymptote. So for example, if I was looking at this top right bit, I know it's not going to look something like this or like this because it has to like hug these asymptotes. And, th and what you'll find is since we're just, these rational functions are just polynomials, they always kind of follow the same patterns. Um, for example, you could ask the same question. Like um, if we looked at something like um, x plus 2, f of x is equal to x plus 2, x minus 1, we could graph this. We can see that at x equal negative 2, we have an a intercept and an x is equal to 1. We have something here. We can maybe look at, well, if we plug in the number 0, we're going to get a negative number. So it's going to be something like this. And so we can get a nice graph like this. And you could ask the same question, how do I know the shape of the graph? And that's because you know all polynomials kind of look the same. Um, and so if we do them enough times, especially when it comes to rational functions, we can, we can see that they just really nicely hug these asymptotes. They're not going to kind of curve and do stuff in weird directions. Now, if you really wanted to be pedantic, I guess you could understand its um, differential properties. So we can look at its rates of change and we can look at curvature and stuff like that. But it, to be honest, I think it might confuse you even more because a lot of these rational functions, they might not have turning points. For example, this, this um, um, rather, they might not have stationary, um, uh, yes, turning points, so stationary, uh, stationary points, sorry. Um, they might just have weird points of inflections that aren't stationary. Um, yeah, so um, it comes with practice, but, you know, I, to be honest, I haven't sketched many of, the, many of these graphs. I've sketched maybe two or three, I mean, not two or three, but through my time, maybe four or five. In high school, I only sketched only like four, yeah, about four or five. So um, I, you'll see that, you know, these aren't scary. It's not like there's endless possibilities of what um, they can be, like what there is to be sketched. Cool. So let's mark this as answered and let's move on to our next topic, which is in algebra. But a really, really great question. Thanks for that question. Um, so this is indeed the presentation, cool. So onto algebra, we're going to be solving, uh, doing three things. We're going to be solving over C, so that's over the complex numbers. We're going to be uh, studying De Moivre's theorem, so that's when we raise a complex number uh, to a certain power, to an in, uh, not it doesn't have to be to an integer power, just to a certain power. And we're going to be covering partial fraction decomposition. Now, we're going to be studying partial fraction decomposition alone, but we a uh, very, um, very important note is especially we want to understand these in regards to um, integrating rational functions. And this, this really helps to, if we have a partial fraction decomposition of a rational function, that means we can integrate them really easily. Um, but we'll be covering calculus a bit later, so yeah. So first, let me just try to get everyone on the same page regarding complex numbers. First, we have the building block, the square root of negative one. That's just i. And we're expected to solve over these complex numbers. Some handy tools we might need are something like polynomial division. Um, I was doing a question with a couple of Skyline students. Um, not sure if it was last week or the week before, but we, uh, we did a lot of polynomial division because it kind of it helped us. Um, you might know... Um, instead of polynomial division, you might know something called synthetic division. And this is totally fine too. Um, to be honest, I, I only use polynomial division, but whatever works for you and whatever you're comfortable with, that's totally fine. The next thing we want to do, I'll learn, is this sum of squares. Now, the sum of squ uh, squares is going to be this a plus bi and this a minus bi. Um, just as an aside, remember I told you that a squared minus b squared is equal to a plus b, a minus b. 
And in fact, you can kind of show that these, um, these, are, these formulas are kind of one and the same thing, but with some, a, a substitution here or there. So we've got the sum of squares, we've got this polynomial division, and finally, we've got this conjugate um, root theorem. You might not know it by its name, but it just says that if P of X has rational coefficients and a root A plus BI, then A minus BI is a root. So for example, these are PXs in the form of something like 3X squared plus um, 2X plus one, or something like, I mean, it says rational coefficients, so technically we could have pi X cubed plus E, um, and it just says if we find out that um, p, if we find out that a root is a plus bi, then we know that's conjugate that is a root. And I'm sure you've seen this a lot in the past because we, I mean, we have to use it a lot. So yeah, let's just go through um, precisely that, a question that requires um, solving over c. This is from the 2017 exam, question three. Here we go. So we've got enough space to do everything. Um, it's worth three marks. So again, quite a substantial amount. And we can see that z cubed plus az squared plus 6z plus a is equal to zero. And z is a complex number. And a is a real coefficient. We're given that z is equal to one minus i is a solution of the equation. Find all other solutions. Now immediately, what I'm looking at is A is real and all these other numbers are real. So what we can say is um, we can say since all coefficients um, since all coefficients are real then uh, the, uh, Z is equal to one plus I is also a solution, is also a solution. Perfect. And so what we can do is we can do some sort of, um, now this is not polynomial division or synthet synthetic division, but it's kind of a, a bit of a combination of both. We're kind of using our, uh, what we call equating coefficients. So I can write, so the Z cubed plus a z squared plus six z plus a. We can rewrite that as, well, the first root, the second root. And well, it's a cubic equation. So it has three roots and we can just claim this arbitrary root is, well, z plus k. And we don't know what k is yet, but we know it's gonna have another root because it's a cubic equation. We can, you know, use the, we can expand this. It's not quite going to be the difference of two squares, but we can say that this is just going to be z squared minus one minus i z minus one plus i z um, plus, now this is going to be, well, I'll write one plus i, one minus i, but as you can see, this is just going to be the sum of two squares. And then we've got the z plus k on the side. And if you do some um, algebra, some working out, this comes down really nicely to z squared minus two z plus two. And of course, we just got this z plus k tacked on the end. If we expand this, we're gonna get z cubed plus k minus two z squared plus two minus two k z plus two k. Now, if you're more comfortable, you can do this in two steps, but I've just factorized everything um, to the to the uh, to its um, to its like terms and kind of combine its like terms rather. And so we can we've got this on the right hand side. On the left hand side, we've just got z cubed plus a z squared plus six z plus a. Now we can equate its coefficients. If we look at z cubed, it doesn't tell us anything. If we look at z squared we can see that a is equal to k minus two, all right? If we look at z, we can see that six is equal to two minus two k. And so that means um, two k is equal to two minus six, 
Um, we got, uh, sorry, we've got a question. How did you get the minus two Z in the first line? That's a really great question, Ryan. So we've got this, um, we can see that the I's cancel out. So this minus and the minus, um, this becomes a plus and this minus and plus becomes a minus. So the I's cancel out. And so what we're left with is just this minus one here and this minus one here. And that's how we get the negative two. I hope that clears things up. Um, cool. Now, we, um, following on, looking at the Z, we've got the six is equal to two minus two K. And this two K is equal to uh, two minus six, which is equal to negative four. And so we've got this two K is equal to negative four. And so that we've got K is equal to negative two. And so finally, we can plug that in back to this A. And if K is negative two, that means A is equal to negative four. Um, we didn't quite have to find what A is, <laughs> um, but now we know all these solutions, all the roots, all, all the solutions rather. So we can write solutions are, We've got the first one, which is Z minus, uh, Z is equal to one minus I, which they gave us. We've got its conjugate, Z is equal to one plus I. And finally, we've got this, uh, this K is equal to negative two. So we know just on the side, we know that Z uh, minus two is a solution. And since we know Z minus two is a solution, uh, sorry, yep, Z minus two is a solution, um, we know that Z is equal to two is uh, also a solution. I mean, is, yeah, um, is a, sorry, is a root I should write. Equals two is a solution. Perfect. Um, alrighty, so we can um, finish that. So that's worth three marks. Um, let's see how I'm doing for time. Perfect, got 15 minutes. Now, this one is a bit of a tricky one, I admit. I think um, not many students got this next one right. But anyway, we've got this polar form. Uh, we've got this notion of polar form now when we're talking about complex numbers. Um, when we express the number x plus yi, we can call that um, form maybe rectangular form or Cartesian form. And, um, but when we're looking at polar form, we don't, we don't, we don't really uh, define it by its real and imaginary components. Rather, we look at this angle from the positive x uh, axis. So it's satisfying this tan theta is equal to y on x. And we're looking at r, which is its magnitude, which is just this x squared plus y squared. Uh, the square, square root of that, rather. Now we achieve that this x plus y i is equal to r cis theta, uh, which you probably use a lot. But again, um, you should also know that this cis theta is just a contraction. What it means is cosine plus i sine theta. Um, now, with that knowledge, we can actually um, do a lot of things. So, and the most powerful thing is working with, um, sorry? Um, hello, Gypsy. Sorry, I'm not sure if you answered Ryan's question of how did you get to negative 2z in the third line? Yeah, that's okay. I, I, I did answer it, but thank you. Yes. Oh, okay. Cool. Um, Thanks. Perfect. Um, cool. Now, um, cool. Thank you, Jamin. Now let's, uh, yeah, so let's just work. Um, so the reason why polar form is so powerful is because it lets us multiply and divide. Um, I say numbers, but for what we're talking about is complex numbers, which is technically, I mean, a lot of the numbers um, very easily. We have this multiplication, which just means we multiply the magnitudes and we add the angles. And we've also got this division, which just means we divide the magnitudes and we subtract the angles. So this is very, very, um, very, very intuitive. You can kind of um, almost think about it when we're looking at maybe, um, I mean, this is kind of the reason why, but if we look at something like a e to the power of k x, um, sorry, a e to the power of b x divided by b c e to the power of d x, we can see that just is going to be a on c multiplied by e to the power of b minus d x. Um, when we're working with the exponential function, uh, we can see that, well, yeah, we just subtract whatever whatever's inside, whatever the exponent is. Um, 
and we divide whatever these magnitudes at the front are. Now, this is thanks. The reason why this uh, relates to complex numbers so so well is because of something called like Euler's equation, which is well uh, widely regarded as very beautiful theorem. But I mean, you don't need to know that. We just need to know that we need to subtract the angles and divide the magnitudes when we're dividing, and we need to add the angles and multiply the magnitudes when we're uh, multiplying. Finally, we've gone through the operations of multiplication and division. For exponentiation, we can use the Moivre's theorem, which is really, you can think of just a repetition of multiplying. So if z is equal to r cis theta, then if we raise it to the nth power, and n doesn't have to be an integer, n can just be whatever, uh, we get this r to the n cis n theta. Let's have a go of practicing um, uh, this knowledge in the last year's exam, question seven. And if I recall, only about 36% got this one right, and maybe I think around 16% got this right, Some, somewhere around those numbers. So this question is notoriously, I, I guess, pretty difficult. Um, now, just, just as a starter, um, I think what you'll notice is this is part C and part D. And um, it looks like this is a lot of work for one mark. Now, they didn't, in part A and part B, what happens is we establish what this actual 3 minus root 3i is in polar form. So just an aside, let's do that together. Um, and then we can work out what C and D is. So let's work out what this 3 minus root 3i is. So let me just write, let z is equal to 3 minus root Three i, and the first thing I want to look at when I'm looking at a complex number is what quadrant is it in? Um, for this one, it's in quadrant four. Hopefully, you can notice that. We get um, the first thing I want to. Uh, the next thing I want to do is find its magnitude. So this is r is equal to three squared plus root three squared. That's just going to be equal to nine plus three, which is just equal to twelve. Uh, root 12, rather. Perfect. Now, if we look at tan theta, we know that's going to be negative root 3 on 3. Um, I personally like looking at it as negative 1 on root 3. It just helps me a little bit. And since we know it's in the fourth quadrant, we can say that theta, therefore, is negative pi on 6. Now I'm kind of going really fast through these exact values and stuff like that, but hopefully it's been drilled into you, both in methods and specialists. And specialist. Now, the next thing I want to do is these questions ask for um, this complex number, but to the nth power. Um, so let's try to just understand what it means to be to the nth power. Um, first thing I can write, so this z is equal to root 12 cis, of negative pi and six. And we can understand that the nth power, we just have to raise, remember, the magnitude to that power, root 12 to the power of n. Um, and then we're gonna look at our cis and we're gonna multiply it by n. So we're gonna get this negative n pi on six. And I'm gonna do this, it might seem like a, it might seem like a uh, bit of a leap of faith now, but I'm just going to expand this cis contraction. So we look at this, this is just going to be root 12 to the power of n, and then I'm going to write cosine of negative n pi on 6 plus i sine of negative n pi on 6. All right, so we've understood what z to the power of n is, and we, now we need to know what are the integer values for n for which this is real? And what are the intervalue values of n for which it equals, well, what it's saying is, is purely imaginary. So when is it real and when is it purely imaginary? Cool, so let's look at part A first. Part A says, we need to know when is z to the n real? So let's look at z to the n. ZTN, um, well, let's just, yeah, let's just, I, I guess I'll just write it. Z to the N is equal to root 12, the power of N, cosine of negative N pi on six, plus I sine negative N pi on six. 
All right. So for it to be real, we want to get rid of this component here because that's the only thing that's making an imaginary, that component there. And so we have to understand, all right, cool. Then when is sine equal to zero? So let's look at, so we can write maybe a sentence. So Zn is real when this sine of negative n pi on six is equal to zero. So now all we have to do, it just comes to a equation of solving when is negative n pi on six equal to zero. And hopefully you should know that it's going to be multiples of pi. So we get this negative n pi on six is equal to k pi, where just k is just an integer. And so if we do a little bit of rearranging and stuff like that, we get n is equal to negative six k. And perfect. We just found out when zn is real. For our part b, um, I think you can imagine it's going to be a very similar process. So when does Zn equal Ai, where A is a constant, is a real constant rather. So now if we look at Zn, um, if we look at, let's just, yeah, let's just write again, Zn is equal to root 12 to the power of n cosine of negative n pi on six plus i sine of negative n pi on six. If we look at this now, now we just want the imaginary part. So we want to cross out this one here. So that's just going to be when, um, so it, let me just skip a little bit. We just want to solve this cosine of negative n pi on six is equal to zero. And so this is going to be at multiples of um, pi on two. Um, Yep, pi on two, not quite multiples of pi on two, but it's going to be something like negative n pi on six is equal to pi on two. And then we can always add pi to get to the other um, reflection. So it's going to be add pi k. And if you do a little bit of arithmetic, you're going to get this n is equal to negative outside of three plus six k. And yeah, this is precisely it. Now, again, not many students got this right. And so if you did get this correct, you're looking at, you know, over 40, um, over 38 at least. Um, and really it's not too hard. It's just really understanding. And this is what something a lot of students don't understand is that this cis actually does just mean this cosine plus i sine. So hopefully if we get something like this on your exam, you'll be able to do it. Cool. Now we've got a couple more minutes. We've got this four more minutes and I don't think I'll be able to do this whole um, partial fraction decomposition, but I can at least talk about partial fractions for a little bit. So the last thing on today's agenda is making sure we have a good understanding of partial fractions. So partial fractions, like I said um, a bit earlier in the presentation, are used to decompose rational functions or rational fractions rather into components that are easily integrable. So if we look at this x squared minus three divided by x squared plus two, x minus one, we can see that it's easily, I mean, we get this really nice right-hand side. We can use, um, now I'm kind of giving away the last, I like the um, middle of our presentation, but we can use, I mean, u substitution here. And then we can, here we can just use the log to integrate. Um, note, the reason why we want to decompose them is because the left-hand side is much, much harder to integrate than the right-hand side. I'm not even sure you could do it directly. So yeah, cool. Um, now let's just have a revision on the rules to actually perform the partial fraction decomposition. We must know what factors in the denominator corresponds to which components. So if we have a linear factor just by itself, we can just get this easily a on ax plus b. Now, if we have a repeated factor, we have to have it's the whole repeated factor, but all the ones, um, all the factors below it too. So we've got this long formula here. But really what that means is what we're looking at, um, say for example, if we had ax plus b squared and we had something, so like this x and ax plus b, ax plus b squared, we're just looking at a on ax plus b plus b, on ax 
plus b squared. So we're decomposing it each of these uh, repeated factors. And finally, if we have an irreducible, and it's usually just going to be a quadratic, so I've only kind of wrote that in here, we've got this, uh, we've got this fraction here. So we'll have to have this ax plus b. We can't just have constants. Cool. Now, for this next question, it's actually a verify question. So we didn't actually have to find its um, partial fraction decomposition, but I, I kind of wanted to do it. But um, we've, we've run out of time. So maybe, maybe at the end of the presentation, if we have a bit of extra time, we'll do it. If not, um, have a go at doing this question. This is from the 2019 exam, question seven. Um, yeah, you just need to verify that this. Now, ordinarily with a verify question, you don't want to just find a decomposition because it'll take too long. What you want to do rather is we look at this right-hand side and we just want to put it over the same denominator and we can hopefully see that it'll be exactly equal to that one. Um, but yeah, I mean, for now, let's take a question and break time. Let's look at Mentimeter, see if we have anything uh, any questions there? I mean, there could be questions about procrastination or about study or about anything, hobbies or um, uni life or how, what, you know, how, what was it like when you got an ATAR, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, uh, make sure you, tr if you need anything, ask. Cool. Um, so we're gonna, just, just before I start answering questions, we're gonna be doing this from 11 o'clock to 11.10. And then we're going to come back with the study of calculus. Um, cool. Um, actually, before we um, before we do that, I'm just going to share my other screen. And um, the folks at UBS um, have actually made a video for um, kind of just a really nice, inspiring video piece that I want to show you guys. So. Um, just bear with me as I just share my screen. So share my screen, you'll see, and you might recognize this face a little bit. Um, whoops, I don't sure if I um, enabled audio. Yep, share computer sound, cool. All right, let's have a look. Hello, Skyline students. I'm Jamin and I work in the investment bank technology sector at UBS. My work involves software programming and helping with business analysis. So I studied in New South Wales for the HSC about two years ago and I enjoy taking maths, English, chemistry and physics. There weren't any specific subjects which led me to my role, rather none of my subjects were economics or business related and so my advice to my year 12 self would be to make sure to eat well and sleep well and make sure to keep those that uh, that diet nutritious because in my HSC period I was mostly at home and had to be responsible for my own food and lastly best of luck thank you amazing Cool. I think that, that that point is really important. I mean, I, I'm, I, I struggle with it a little bit too, but it's important to sleep, you know, eight hours a day, try to be as healthy as you can. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Let me reshare my screen and I can answer some questions. Can you go over how you got that horizontal asymptote again? Yeah, for sure. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to try to, so I've skipped a, um, I'm trying to, going to try to walk you through things a little bit. Uh, this is what I did for my year 11 special students um, a couple of weeks ago. So let's look at the limit as x approaches infinity to 1 over x. Now, just, just in our heads, we can see that, well, that's just, a, that's just a hyperbola, right? So we've got this thing going on here. And as x approaches infinity, we can see that this graph over here slowly approaches that y equals 0. So as x gets bigger and bigger and bigger, we can understand this denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so we can understand that this is going to be equal to zero. 
Hopefully that makes sense. Does that make sense? Could you type in the chat if that makes sense? Just, just or a thumbs up. Okay, maybe it didn't make sense again. Um, that's okay. So uh, we're looking, let me just try to explain it one more time. And if, if it doesn't make sense, maybe after watching the recording again, um, something will click. So we're looking at what happens when X gets really, really big. And so that's what it means to approach infinity, getting really, really big. Uh, thank you, Rico, for the thumbs up. Um, so when X gets really, really big, well, let's think of the big number. Let's think of maybe a thousand. So when X is a thousand, we can look at one over a thousand. We think, oh, that's a, that's a pretty small number. That's 0 0.001, uh, I'm not sure. Something like that, right? Now, okay, that's a that's a pretty big number. I can I can, I can roll with that. What about when X is even small, uh, even bigger? Because we're trying to approach X to infinity. So what about X divided by you know even more and more zeros? We get the zero point zero 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 one. And eventually, when we think of this notion of infinity, it's gonna all the way. Um, eventually, it's gonna disappear to zero. And so that's why we have this actually an asymptote at, for this hyperbola because eventually it's going to approach zero. Now, this is very, like, um, this is very um, useful regarding um, the thing we talked about before, is because when we compare something like, well, let's try to compare something like x on x squared. That's exactly what we were doing um, before. We can see that, well, this is kind of like 1 on x. And so as this approaches infinity, well, I mean, as this approaches zero, as X approaches infinity. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this study of limits is, it, it takes a little bit longer than, um, than a couple of minutes, but it, it is very worthwhile endeavor if you, um, if you wanna really understand these asymptotes. Otherwise, the only way to do questions like this is really by guessing. So I really do, um, do think you should, I mean, yeah. You have a couple, like a month until the exam, I think you can definitely smash out understanding limits in a couple of hours. And especially if you're a Skyline student, if you come to my special three, four or my special one, two classes, we can definitely go through it in a very, very gory detail. Cool. Um, all right, let's move on to the next question. For well, the question we did for the topic solving over C, solving a K for K was a must, right? Yeah. So um, solving for K was actually what the question was asking. They wanted to find what that third root was. Now, another way you could find K is we could take our quadratic that we found. So let's have a look at that quadratic we found. Um, when did we do it? See this quadratic here? This Z squared plus 2Z plus uh, z squared minus 2z plus 2. What we could do is we could take this um, function of a's and we could divide it by this. And then hopefully we would have got this nice z plus k. But um, yeah, I mean, I think the polynomial division would have taken a bit longer. But if you're more comfortable with that, you can do that too. For the complex number, why did you choose the imaginary part to determine when zn is real? Yeah. Good, good question. So let's look at when Zn is real. I, I took this cross, I wanted to cross out the imaginary part. Now, it, it doesn't really matter what the real part is, but we don't want that imaginary part. And so we can see that Zn is real when this imaginary part, this sine negative n pi on six is zero. We have, to, uh, ironically or counterintuitively, to understand when it's real, we have to understand, uh, we have to know when it's, uh, when it's not imaginary, I guess you can say. Um, and so that's why I did that. Cool. Yeah, so it's a good question. So we look at the Demois. So this is, I thought we'd get this question. Now, remember, um, sorry, let me read the question just in case no one saw it. Um, you got a negative, but the examination report answer is positive. Now, Remember, k can be any integer. So k I defined as just an integer. 
So let's just take another constant, for example. Let's say that uh, we've got this K2. K2 is just an integer, but we define K2 by negative K. And so we get this N is equal to negative six. Um, and rather, we can define, sorry, we can say this K is equal to negative K2 because K can be any integer and K2 can be any integer. We can just play around with the negatives a little bit. And so what happens is this N is equal to, well, just six K2. Now, uh, and that might be a little bit confusing, but this, these negatives don't really mean anything because of K can be anything. Um, yeah, for example, let's, let's look at, um, well, all we care about, so let's look at 6K and let's look at negative 6K. And we can plug in numbers of what K is. But we, all we care about is what, um, what's the set of numbers we get. So what this is actually saying, rather, is 6K is the multiples of 6. So when we think of multiple 6s, we can say like 6, 12, 18, but we can also say 0 or negative 6, etc. So what are the multiples of 6? 6, 12, 8, you know, you can count. We've been doing this since high school, uh, since primary school. And what this is saying is what are the multiples of negative 6? And hopefully you can see that, well, okay, negative 6, negative 12. But actually 0 and 6 and 12 are also multiples of negative 6. So we can see that these two are equivalent. And so it, the examination report showed one way, maybe because it's a bit more pretty when we don't see that negative, but either way is definitely correct. Can you go back to the intro slide with the definition of the conjugate root theorem? Yes. Um, it could be that I, I think I know where you're getting at. I think I might have made a mistake. Um, I think I wrote rational instead of real. Yeah, sorry. I should write real here. Thanks for that. Um, and that will be amended in the, in the notes when I send them out. Perfect. So it's 11.10 and we can start our next uh, area of study in algebra, in calculus rather. Um, hopefully you had a little break, there's just stretch and stuff like that. Um, actually, since we, um, we didn't really take a proper, proper break, let's, um, let's just maybe take a two minute break until 11.13. I just want to fill up my drink bottle and give, uh, have a stretch a little bit. Um, and then we'll be right back to study. All right, see you soon. Oops. Here we go. Hi, my name is Michael Bibalakwa. I'm an analyst within the consumer products and retail team at UBS. Um, I ended up at UBS after studying a double degree of commerce and law. Um, and the two subjects that I probably enjoyed most while I was at school in year 12 were two that I actually didn't end up pursuing at all later on in life, which were literature and chemistry. Um, knowing what I know now, I would say that certainly while uh, your VCE score is important and you should give it all that you've got, it's not going to define your life and you certainly won't be defined by a number um, if things don't turn out well in the end. There are unconventional ways to get into um, different courses and different things later on in life. So I would say certainly give it all you've got, but don't be overcome with stress during this period. My name's Elise and I'm a graduate analyst at UBS, working in the metals and mining team. I graduated from school in 2015 and my year 12 subjects were maths, chemistry, English literature, French, history and biology. The one piece of advice I would give to myself when I was in year 12 is just don't stress too much. You will have worked hard, so just trust yourself, trust your knowledge and everything will fall into place by the time exams come around.
All right, 11.13. Let's um, go into our study of calculus. Now, this is going to be a quite a large area of study. And so I've, I've put in a lot of kind of different topics that I want to cover. Um, one being implicit differentiation, U substitution, arc length, solids of revolution. Uh, these are kind of applications. And then we can finish off our area of study with understanding some like uh, the study of diff equations. Now, um, a lot of these questions in this topic, only about 2% of the state got right or 10% or 16%. So these are very, very hard questions, especially this first one on implicit um, differentiation. So please, please, please don't be discouraged. And it's gonna be a long process. So, um, I mean, in doing this question, it's very, very easy to stuff up. It's worth five marks. Um, I, anyway, I'll, I'll show you in a sec. So first up on calculus, we'll be revising implicit differentiation. For instance, if we have this formula, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared, um, hopefully you can recognize this is the circle with radius r. Um, one thing you might want to ask is, what is the change in y with respect to the change in x? What is dy dx? And to do this, we'll be using the chain rule, but a little variation, a uh, little, it's a slight variation of the one we're used to maybe in methods. So instead of having this dy dx as the subject, we have this du dx as the subject. And we can use it in the following way. Say if you wanted to find the d dx of y squared, we can say, well, that's the d dy of y squared. So we're just saying um, u is equal to y squared, multiplied by dy dx. So we can see that's just 2y dy dx. Now, one way you can think about it is we just have to differentiate it with respect to y and then just tack on a dy dx in the end. Um, perfect. All right. So let's have a go at doing this question, which is notoriously very, very hard. So it is the last year's, uh, you might have tried to do it. This is last year's exam, the last question of last year's exam. And I mean, it looks like a mess. We've got sine, we've got cosine, we've got um, roots, we've got uh, implicit differentiation, and we, they even want it in a special form at the end. So let's see, see if we can do this. So we didn't do that partial fraction question, but we're doing this question here. So we want to find the y dx at this point, root, p, root pi on root six, and then root pi root three, for the curve defined by the relation sine x squared plus cosine y squared is equal to three root two on pi x y. So as you can see, a whole mess. Not many students got this right at all. Um, but it's this, I think this is important uh, lesson. This this uh, question is an important lesson in kind of endurance and perseverance. Um, hopefully, and it teaches a lot maybe about exact values about um, trying to be careful with what you write. Anyway, let's just keep on. Let's just try out the question. So first thing I want to do is just let's write the the, the relation. So we've got the sine of x squared plus this cosine of y squared is equal to three root two on pi x y. All right, no worries. So the next thing I want to do is I just want to, um, is I want to, well, differentiate everything with respect to x. So we've got a mix of chain rules. We've got a mix of product rules. Now I'm going to assume that you're pretty comfortable with um, at your chain rule and your product rule. And so I'm not going to do any substitutions or anything like that, like I did in methods yesterday. But um, yeah, it's important that you really focus because it's quite, quite difficult and it's easy to get lost. So if we differentiate this first one, we're going to get 2x cosine of x squared. And if we differentiate the second one, we're going to get 2y negative, uh, well, rather, let's write it a bit nicer, negative 2y sine of y squared. And since we're differentiating a y, we need to tack on this dy dx at the end. Perfect. 
we've got this three root, root two. We can just take that out as a kind of factor. And then we can differentiate this x, y. And this is just going to be, well, the derivative of the first is one multiplied by the second is y plus the first, which is x multiplied by the derivative of the second, which is just dy dx. Okay, so we've done our first step. Let me just fix that bracket. And already, I think if you got this first step right, maybe that's one or two marks already. So you don't have to stress. The next thing I want to do is move all the dy dx's to the right side and all the like kind of non dy dx's to the left hand side. So we've got this 2x cosine, oops, cosine of x squared minus 3 root 2 on pi y is equal to, and we can factor out this dy dx. First, we've got this 2y sine y squared. And second, we've got this plus 3 root 2 on pi x. Now, remember, I'm going through, I'm going through it quite fast, but hopefully, um, maybe in watching the recording, you can uh, follow along. And also maybe skipping a lot of steps. So um, for me, sometimes I can do the stuff in my head. Maybe for you, you can do more stuff in your head. But um, if you feel like you need to have these intermediate steps, then totally add them in. Now, easily, we can solve for dy dx. That's just going to be, well, we've got this top, 2x cosine of x squared minus 3 root 2 on pi y. Let's just make that a bit nicer. y divided by everything on this bottom one. So 2y sine y squared plus 3 root 2 on pi x. And so we've, we've found dy dx. That's pretty good. We're almost there. But we need to find it at a certain point, and then we need to give it in a form. So already for this dy dx, I think maybe three marks. So we've already gone through three marks. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. So now we have to add in this point root pi root six and root pi root three. So let's try. This is gonna be equal to two multiplied by root pi root six cosine of, let's write it a bit nice, cosine of pi on six minus three root two on pi multiplied by root pi on root three. Okay, numerator is all done. For the denominator, we've got two multiplied by root pi on root three, sine of pi on three, minus three root two on pi, multiplied by root pi on root six. Okay, so now we've, we've plugged everything in. So technically this is the answer. So I think from here, we've already got four marks. And so for that last tiny little mark, we need to get it in the correct form. So how are we going to do this? First, what I would do is I want to evaluate what these kind of trigonometric, um, we want to use our exact values to evaluate what cosine pi and six is and sine pi and three. So we can write, this is equal to two root pi on root six. Cosine of pi and six is just root three on two. Minus, now we can just copy this other stuff down. Divided by, then we can copy this stuff down. Sine pi and three, well, weirdly, that's root three on two as well. Minus, um, sorry, did I, did I make an error there? So this should be a plus, I think. Um, cool, plus three root two on pi dot root pi on root six. Um, okay, now I'm just a bit scared I made a sign error. So let's double check. So this is a plus, the plus is at the bottom, sine pi and three plus, everything's plus. Bottom, everything's plus. Now, if I made, if you feel like I made a sign error somewhere, just just make sure you tell me as soon as you can. 
because we don't want to be making any any uh, any wrong moves. Now, finally, what we can do is we can cancel a lot of stuff out. So for example, this two and this two cancel out. And um, yep, two, two cancel out. Again, this two and this two cancels out. Um, you know, the root pies and stuff like that cancel out as well. So these root pies and root threes in weird ways. And what, what you should end up getting is this root pie. Now I'm going to skip a lot of that because it's going to be a bit messy, but we're going to get root six on root pi divided by root pi uh, plus root three on root pi. Cool. So here, so that's if you, when you cancel out everything, we finally get to this. And again, it's not in that form yet. So obviously we, um, we, we need to do some more. Now, how do I link what I have here to what the form is? The first thing I notice is, well, I need a pi in the top left. And on my form, I have this root pi on root two. So somehow I want to convert this root pi on root two to just a pi. And to do that, we want to times by root pi um, root two. So as if you times by root pi root two, then it's just going to turn into a pi. So if we times, so to times, we can't just times the top left by root pi root two. We have to times the top and the bottom. So we get this pi minus, well, this is going to be just two root three. And on the bottom, we're just going to get um, root two pi. Root two, sorry, my um, my charger is just being a bit finicky today. Let me just try to plug that in. Cool, perfect. Um, so we got this pi minus two root three, and then where was I? Root two pi, because I'm multiplying everything by root pi root two, and then this one is just going to be um, root two root three. And so finally, we're almost there. We've got this pi minus a root b, and they want to factor out this root a. So let's understand what's this a? Well, the a is two, and if they want to factor out a root a, they want to factor out a root two. Pi minus two root three on root two, pi plus root three, which is precisely the form they wanted it in. So this, look, look how many lines this took, so many. But there's, there's a couple of things I want to take you to take away from this. First of all, it's gonna sometimes questions are just hard. You have to put in the time one step by like one step, one step, and eventually you'll get something nice, hopefully. But another thing is don't be discouraged by what you have. Because I I I, I claim and I'm pretty sure that already by this step, so this step here, let me maybe change color. By this step here, I think you've already got three marks, to be honest. And then for this, I think is only just one extra mark. And then maybe like, yeah, you know, like it's worth five marks and it's a very hard question, but just try your best. And I reckon you can get most of the marks anyway. Um, cool. So how does that bring us the time? This is 11.10. Oh, cool. So we spent 15 minutes. So that's totally fine. Cool. If you have any questions, check out the Mentimeter because I understand that was very hard. Um, sorry, didn't mark that one as answered. Cool. Um, next. Now, well, that's all of differential calculus I wanted to cover today. And let's, so let's move on to integral calculus. Um, a real powerful, I <laughs> wrote right, two, that should be tool, is U substitution. And this is when we make an appropriate substitution to evaluate an integral we may have otherwise not known about. And the best way to revise is to just jump right in. No, we don't want to rush the substitution. We want to write all these steps. So let's have a go. Cool. So we want to evaluate cosine squared 2x sine 2x dx. Um, how could we do this? Now, like I said, we just want to make an appropriate substitution. Now, there's a, there's a girl in my class that likes to just skip all these substitutions. And 
I, I don't know how she does it. She's like very smart in that way. But for me, I have to write down these, um, exactly what U is. So I'm just going to write let U is equal to cosine of 2x. And so if we differentiate this, we get this du is equal to negative one half sine of 2x dx. And so if we rearrange for dx, we get this dx is equal to negative two on sine of 2x du. Now, again, this might be a different way than you're usually doing it, but I think in general, actually, it's mostly the same way. Um, since we've found, since we've substituted what u is, now we have to find these terminals in terms of u. So u of pi on 2, that's just going to be equal to cosine of pi, that's just going to be negative 1. Sorry, negative 1. And this u of 3 pi on 4, this is just going to be cosine of 3 pi on 2, and that's just going to be 0. So what we're doing, what we're evaluating is actually the integral from uh, negative one to zero. And our integrand now is, well, let's actually just write, well, cosine squared two X, that's just gonna be U squared now. Let's keep that sine two X. And now we're substituting this DX for um, whatever this expression is. Let's multiply by negative two on sine 2x du. And easily these times cancel out and we just get this negative 2 at the front. So hopefully this is, um, yeah, hopefully now it's quite easy. So we can put this negative 2 at the front to get this negative 2, negative 1 to 0, oops, of u squared. Let's see if I write everything right. Yes, u squared du. Now we can forget about whatever x was, we can forget about um, any weird integrands or uh, differentials or anything like that. We can just evaluate this very, very easy um, definite integral. So we've got this negative two at the front. We've got this integral is just one third u cubed um, between zero, negative one and zero. We've got this negative two outside of zero plus one third, and so we get this negative two thirds. Cool. Um, oh, did I make a did I make a um, error? I differentiated cosine wrong. Oh, of course, I made a very silly error. Yes. Um, thank you to whoever spotted that. It should be yes, negative two sine. So this should be negative one half sine du, um, that doesn't change this, it only changes the whatever was in front. So we got this negative a half, negative one half. Thank you so much to whoever pointed that out, negative a half, negative a half, negative a six. Cool. All right, so I mean, yeah, just, I mean, moral of that is <laughs> don't forget your method stuff when you're doing specialists, I guess. Um, yeah, cool. All right, so that's U substitution. Now, um, yeah, let's keep going. We're gonna explore some applications of integral calculus. Now, these are very important because um, not only does do the exam test us on, well, do you know how to integrate this? Do you know how to differentiate this? Uh, do you know how to plug in an integral uh, plug in, I mean, you know, how that corresponds to on a graph, etc. We need to know some specific applications. So the first one is arc length, which can be represented in one of two ways, through a parametric version and through just kind of a function version. And we want to know about volumes of solids of revolution. Um, this is both about the y-axis and about, about the x-axis. Now, this stuff is super important um, because, I mean, Empirically, in the past couple of exams, it's always kind of been there. And especially now that this exam doesn't have probability anymore because of the 2020 study design, I, I, I think you can be quite certain that there's going to be a, at least one arc length or volume of solids of integration, of revolution, sorry. 
Um, in saying that, let's just jump through a question. Now, this is from the sample exam, um, question eight. And it's, it's not too difficult at all. I think, I think we can do it very easily. Um, cool. So, oh, by the way, just something to note. So the, these arc length um, formulas at the top, they are on your formula sheet. But these volumes of solids of revolution, they're not on your formula sheet. So I'd be very, very careful to not, um, uh, be careful to remember these and rather to not forget them because, um, I don't know, usually when something's on the formula sheet, they're probably gonna test you on it, right? Because they wanna test that you've actually done the content. Cool, so anyway, arc length, let's do it. So write down a definite integral in terms of theta that gives the arc length from theta equals zero to theta equals pi for the curve defined parametrically by whatever this is. Cool, so this is very, very, very chill. First, we need to find what um, the derivative of x is, so we can just write x dash. Let me see if I can do my differential calculus um, correctly now, negative two sine two theta. And this y dash is equal to uh, two cosine two theta. Hopefully that's okay. And now we need to square both of these. So this means that x dash all squared is equal to four sine squared of two theta. And the second one, y dash squared is equal to four cosine squared of two theta. Alrighty. Now what we can do is we can say, well, we've got x dash, we've got y dash. Then the integral L is just gonna be from zero to pi of, now I'll do it in a couple steps, um, but I think you can do it in one step. So four sine squared two theta plus four cosine squared two theta. And hopefully you can notice the, sorry, d theta. And hopefully you can notice that we're just gonna be using the Pythagorean identity here. And so we just get this zero to pi root four d theta, which is just zero to pi two d theta. Now, um, I think that perhaps um, you could have just write this first one L and you got full marks and then you could maybe simplify it in this, hence find the arc length of the arc thing. But anyway, we can just write zero to pi to d theta. That's just gonna be two outside of pi minus zero, which is just two pi. Cool. And so don't be afraid to do it step by step. As you can see, I found x dash first, I found y dash first, and then I squared it, and then I put it in the formula. Um, you could put it straight in the formula, but of course you're just, you're just trying to mitigate error on the exam, risk of error rather. Cool. So that's arc length. Now solids of revolution. Hopefully we can do this. So we want to find the volume of the solid of revolution formed when the graph of y, which is given by that, is rotated about the x-axis over the interval zero to one. So let's have a look at um, the formula and we want to about the x-axis. So we just need to square the y. So that's really nice. I think you can see why that would be nice. Cool. So we can actually go straight into writing down what the actual formula is. It's just gonna be pi multiplied from zero to one of y squared dx. Now it's just a matter, I think already one mark. Now a matter of plugging it all in, pi zero to one. Now y squared is just, well, we just have to get rid of the square root. That makes it really nice. dx. And since we have this, um, I mean, we want to make it look uh, a bit nicer. What we can do is we can separate this one and this two x. So we can say that this is equal to pi, um, the integral from zero to one of one on one plus x squared plus two x on one plus x squared dx. Now, just an, as an aside, just see if you couldn't see this intuition already, I hope you can see that this one on one plus x squared is gonna be related to tan inverse. But this two x on one plus x squared, if we just had let u is equal to one plus x squared, 
we can see that du is equal to 2x dx. And so this top half just kind of cancels out. And so we get this is equal to pi out of front, outside of, sorry, I should use these square brackets, tan inverse x. So that's going to be our 1 plus 1 on x squared. And this 2x on 1 plus x squared, hopefully you can see that it tends to log of 1 plus x squared. And the integral, uh, the, inter, the terminals are just between 0 and 1. Very nice. Cool. And now it's just a matter of plugging stuff in. So we can just plug in the 1 to the first one minus 10 inverse of 0 uh, plus log of 1 plus 0 squared. Now, just one note. Now, this is something I couldn't quite talk about in detail with my method students yesterday, but it is very extremely important that we keep this absolute value sign when we're integrating. Um, maybe not in particular for a definite integral question, but I mean, it's so, so, I mean, actually in particular for all integral questions. So we, we want to keep these absolute value signs. And I think, I mean, the reason why is I hope obvious, but a lot of people don't um, do them. And then in the exam, in the examination report, I always see that students forgot the absolute value or students forgot to put the modular sign. So make sure you have those in. In this question, it doesn't make too much of a difference. So. I mean, that's that. But anyway, we should just get this pi. Now, 10 inverse of 1 is just going to be pi and 4. We got this log 2. And hopefully, you can see that 10 inverse of 0 is just going to be 0. And log of 1 is also going to be 0. And so we get our final answer. Perfect. All right. So, cool. We got 15 minutes. We can do one. Um, integral calculus question. Um, sorry, we can do one differential equations question, which is, or and we can do one uh, kind of acceleration question. But um, yeah, I, I'm wary that both of these questions are very hard. Um, so yeah, so let's just read the slide. The last things we'll cover today are differential equations in this section rather. Uh, for the sake of time, I'll not be formally explaining any theory in the slide, so I'm not going to be talking about um, things like, um, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to be telling you how to exactly solve the differential equation, like, um, or like stuff like how to integrate certain things, but I'm just going to show you the overall process. Um, now, yeah, we'll do a worked example to show you my method of solving these types of equations, which hopefully will help. Now, the first example is a very, very hard differential equation question. It's, uh, worth, it's on the 2016 exam question 10 with five marks. So it's the last question, super, super hard. And the second will be using this uh, very, very nice identity. A is equal to V multiplied by dV dx. Now, there are a lot of for, like, formulas uh, we can rewrite for A. One has X, one has V, um, one has just like D dx and stuff like that. Uh, I claim that this is the only one that you really need to remember. So if you need to remember a formula in the exam, just remember A is equal to V dV dx. And hopefully that will help you out um, a lot. Alrighty. So let's have a look at this question. It says we need to solve the differential equation. Root 2 minus x squared dy dx is equal to 1 on 2 minus y. So let's see, um, we're given an initial value and we want to express at the end y as a function of x. So let's have a go. Again, the first thing um, I want to do, um, oh no, they, they already give us the question, so it's okay. So the first thing I want to do is I want to swap um, the sides of the variables. And the reason why I want to do this is we can't integrate as is. It wouldn't make sense. For, so, for example, if I try to integrate this regards to dx and this regards to dx, I'd be integrating this like y's in terms of dx's and it doesn't really work in x's in terms of dy's. What we need to do is swap those around. So we got this one on 
sorry, <laughs> two minus y, two minus y dy dx is equal to one on root two minus x squared. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And I'm just gonna do an intermediate step um, to just kind of help us a little bit. So we got this two minus y here, but we can notice that this is actually the same as root two squared minus x squared. And the reason I wanna do that is because when we integrate this, um, uh, it really helps. Um, cool. Thanks, Yamin. Uh, I think uh, after this question, I, I'll address a lot of them. Cool. Um, all right. So let's try to integrate both sides with respect to x. So we get this integral of 2 minus y dy is equal to the integral of 1 on root, root 2 squared minus x squared bum, 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 dx. Cool. And so hopefully you can do this really easily, 2y minus half y squared is equal to sine inverse of x on root 2 plus c. And of course, we're going to plug in our initial values that y1 is equal to 0. And all that means is that 1, 0 is a point. So if we plug in everything, 1, 0, the left hand side just becomes 0, and the right hand side becomes sine inverse of one on root two plus c. So we can write c is equal to negative pi on four. Perfect. So we've solved the equation and already we've got most of the marks. But now, like it says, we need to solve express y as a function of x. But already I can, or I can confidently say we've got maybe three or four marks. And that wasn't that much working for three or four months, but you know, at least we gave it a try. So let's try to solve this now. So we've got this, so we've got that two y minus half y squared is equal to sine inverse of x on root two minus pi on four. I just wanna get rid of um, this half here. So I'm just gonna multiply everything by two. Four y minus y squared is equal to two sine inverse of x on root two minus pi on two. And what what I want to do is solve for y, right? But currently I have a quadratic. Now what I'll have to do is complete the square somehow to solve for y. And to do that, I just want to get rid of that pesky negative. So I'm going to multiply everything by negative one. Y squared minus four y is equal to negative two sine inverse of x on root two plus pi on two. Now to solve the square, hopefully you can see all you have to do is plus four to both sides. Plus pi on two plus four. And so this left-hand side just becomes one minus two all squared is equal to negative two sine inverse of x on root two plus pi on two plus four. And hopefully we can get to this stage that y is equal to two plus or minus square root of, oops, negative two sine inverse of x on root two plus pi on two plus four. But all of a sudden we, 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 we've noticed that we've got a plus or minus. And that doesn't really make sense because we've got a point here. We know that the point one zero is on the graph. So we know that, let's write in brackets, one zero is on the graph. So let's plug that in. So zero is, equal, is gonna equal two plus or minus square root of something. And hopefully you can see that, well, this is always going to be a positive number. And so the only uh, possible way that we can get to uh, minus something, uh, well, the only way we can get to minus something is equal to zero is, well, if this is going to be the minus. So we can finally write, so y is equal to two 
has to be the minus square root of negative two sine inverse of x on root two plus pi on two plus four. That should be the answer. Cool. Now um, we have, um, we finished calculus at 1155, but I want to take this, um, this break at 1155 till 12. I want to make it like a, a proper break. So let's uh, answer some questions. We'll skip uh, this question for now, but I mean, you can always do it in your own time. So let's look at Mentimeter. Cool. I noticed that you didn't cover the graphing part of the complex number. I found these questions hard. Did you? Um, yeah, so I didn't cover the graphing part of the complex number. Um, that's not because I find it easy or I find it super simple. It's just because I wanted to get um, through a lot of stuff in my presentation and I just didn't choose to uh, didn't choose to put that in. Now, uh, I did find these like a bit difficult and I think the way I, um, I mean, I didn't find them difficult by the time I got to the exam. And I think the way I tried to best understand these complex number questions, um, again, is to do practice exams. And if you're totally lost, it's important to try to get help from your teachers. Um, if you don't have good teachers, of course that sucks. Um, but I mean, talk about it with your peers, etc. cetera. Um, also, if you Google, there are a lot of questions, uh, there are a lot of YouTube videos and stuff like that that show solutions that's like kind of graphing type questions. Um, again, if you're a Skyline student, you can always come to my classes. We've gone through a couple. Um, anyway. What keeps you motivated while studying? Yeah, that's a really great question. So like the one thing I found since coming to uni is that like, um, and you're allowed to ask these unrelated questions. I mean, this is the whole point of um, the revision series, not just about specialists, but just about how to maximize exam scores and do the best you can. Now, what keeps me motivated by, um, while studying? I can give my answer, but um, Boswell and Jamin, do you want to kind of chip in here as well? Hello. Hey. Hey. Do you see this question up on the screen? Do you yeah. have any thoughts? Um, Basil, do you want to go first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so what keeps me motivated while studying? So um, usually, oh, like specifically for uh, maths, I like to understand, like for me, I'm more of a applications guy so I like the applications of mathematics so um, sometimes I like to sort of like watch YouTube videos on maths like uh, a few examples would be like uh, free blue one brown sure. um, but basically what those uh, videos go into is sort of like the like cool applications of maths like you know how, how like uh, example would be like projectile motion and then it'll be like how is this used in the design of rockets and like spaceships and I think that's pretty cool so that kind of motivates me to study so understanding like why you're studying the topic and like how it can be used is what motivates me yeah no for sure if I could just yeah. chip in on that like um, I watched through one round two even though I'm more pure um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's like important to not look at maths as just like numbers isolated. We want to yeah. kind of try and visualize them and see how they're cool. And like, I think for sure, like, um, it can, mo it can really motivate you when you feel like you're not doing it for nothing, but you're going to use it in the future somehow or it's cool somehow. Yeah. What about you, Joan? Yeah, I, I agree with what Bonson said. Um, for me, um, I've tried a couple of different methods, including um, just I've tried the Pomodoro technique where you sure. just, you know, you study for 25 minutes, you take a five minute break and then you keep going. And then there are a lot of apps that do that. And then um, I did that for a while. And then I went to um, just trying to set goal, set my goals for the day. And so um, I always make, 
these um, timetables where I set out how much time I have in the day that I could spend on studying and, and everything else, right? I just take away all my sleep time, all my eating time, and like uh, a few hours for just like relaxing. And then you have all that time and then you try and um, set out, oh, today I will focus on maths on this topic and I'll try and um, make sure that I do as many questions that I can for this. And then you try and master it before you move on to something else. And then another thing that you might not expect is exercise actually helps a lot. <laughs> um, for me, especially in uni now, um, sometimes it can be quite tough getting through a lot of um, studying. But then, um, so I started running, and then after you do exercise, you actually get, like, you feel more, mo well, I feel more mo more motivated. Um, even though you feel like, oh, I must be really tired after I exercise, so I won't waste my energy, right? But really, it um, releases a lot of, you know, endorphins, and, like, it makes you feel a lot more happy, and um, that makes me more motivated to study. Yeah, for sure. I think that's that's a really good point. You need to treat your body um you know you need to look after your body and like uh that endorphins thing is su super important because it's not just about um you know you can always put in three four hours of study but you want to put three four hours of efficient study and uh, a lot of time you know um if you exercise if you eat well i think you you, you can stay more focused yeah definitely yeah cool thank you guys let's mark that one as answered can you show what was the chain rule for implicit differentiation again? Yep, totally. And don't stress if you miss any of these because you will um, you can uh, uh, you will get the recording afterwards. Um, boom, boom, chain rule. Here we go. So a one way to think about it: anytime you're doing a chain rule. Now this maybe is a sacrilegious to a mathematician um, like me, but you can kind of think of it like this. You, you're really cancelling out some stuff if you look at it as fractions. And so you end up with just this du dx. And that works with any kind of variation of the chain rule. So let me just, sorry, ignore my scribbles. Yeah, hopefully you got that. Cool. Last question. Those questions were awesome. Yet, a challenge I face when completing SACs and exams is that whenever I make a simple mistake for such a huge question, I panic and make more mistakes. How could I remain calm? Yeah, that, that's, really, that's really a great question. Um, uh, I, I know that every single person in the sim call would have you know, got to a sack and you know, panicked at one sack um, at some point in their life. Um, the way I kind of mitigate this is I just go slow. So I found out through my empirical, just, just me being empirically, uh, just how I work and all the sacks and exams I've done is if I take my time and I don't make that simple mistake, um, then not only um, will I not make the mistake and get the answer right, but also um, I actually save time by taking my time. And that seems counterintuitive, but what happens if you, if you make a mistake, you have to go all the way up to the front. You have to cross out a whole bunch of stuff. You like start to panic. It feels bad because you don't have enough room and like with the lines they give you, you might have to like scribble in something really small. And so, I mean, I try to just take my time, but um, yeah, Boswell, do you, I mean, do you have any insights? Uh, yep. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, Jami, you want to go first? Oh, okay, <laughs> okay. Um, so um, for, that happens a lot as well. And even now it sometimes happens, but what, what helps, like what Yancy said, you take time, but also um, you want to, a lot of the time, like I've noticed that for the exams that I don't do as well in, I try and rush through. Like I finish a question, I move on to the next question straight away. And I try and do as much as I can in as little time as I can. But in the end, um, when I do have that time left, so say I have half an hour left in the exam, I go through and look at my answers again. And I can see that I've made some silly mistakes and then um, it makes me quite like demotivated in a way because you're like, oh, what if I made this mistake here? What if <laughs> yeah. my other question was answered as well as well? So 
it helps when you, after you finish your question, you go through and you try to do that question again, but quicker in a way. So you, it's almost like checking your answer, but you also want to try and um, maybe just enter the numbers into your calculator without um, writing anything down. Or you could just like try and um, think about another way to do it. And then that way it will give you a lot of reassurance. So even if you don't end up having enough time checking your answers, you still have a lot more confidence to continue on with the rest of your exam. Yeah, actually, that, that's a good point. You want to, you like, you don't want your brain to dwell on all the mistakes. You want to just quickly kind of go on autopilot a little bit. Um, yeah, Boswell, any, any other insights? Yeah, so I agree with like building up the confidence in the exam. So what I like to do is I usually tackle the very simple questions, like the one or two markers, and then that kind of, you know, you're just getting it out of the way and then you also build a like build a sense of confidence in the exam. So when you tackle the harder questions, which are worth more marks, um, like you already know that you've pretty much finished some, some part of the exam, so you don't have to worry about that anymore. So then you can dedicate and focus your attention to those big questions. Um, I'm not sure if that works for other people, but it certainly does work for me. Yeah, so I for guess. sure. I, I, I totally agree. I mean, yeah. uh, sometimes, you know, you want, you want to have a balance because you don't want to focus all on the simple questions, but usually you can tackle, you can just um, smash out a lot, two, three, four, one or two markers, and then your, your brain is on a roll. You, know, you feel yeah. confident you can do anything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Totally great. Cool. All right. Thanks for those questions, everybody. And thanks for Jamin and Bozov for answering as well. Um, just keep them coming in. Um, we can also answer, I mean, I th I think all of us went to uni and stuff like that. Yeah, we would have. Um, and so if you have any questions at uni and stuff like that, or um, how much do your high school marks mean or whatever, you we can answer those as well. Um, cool. So we, uh, I just want to take a proper break because we've been doing a lot of maths and we've been doing a lot of very, very hard questions. So let's take a break until um, 12.05 and then we'll come back and we'll do some, uh, what do we have next on the agenda? Uh, vectors. So we'll do some vectors questions. So we'll break um, till 12.05. So get a drink, go to the toilet, do whatever you need, and I'll see you in five minutes. Okay, see you then. Hi, I'm Boswell and I'm currently a third year cadet at UBS. My role is a quantitative analyst in the equities division and my responsibilities involve alg algorithmic trading and data analytics. My biggest career highlight has been the opportunity to learn a lot about both the business and technology as it ties in directly what I'm, with what I'm currently learning at university. I study maths and computer science and during high school I really enjoyed maths and physics. The advice of students sitting the exams is to just relax and don't let your results define you. If you've already put in effort throughout the year and consistently studied, then you're pretty much guaranteed to do well. Cool, so we're back. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that um, inspirational video by Boswell. Um, I'm going to share my screen again. Alrighty, so yeah, let's go. So actually, before I start, I got a question from Steve um, asking, is this recording going to be shared with us for review? For, oh my God, let me try again. Is this recording going to be shared with us for reviewing? And if so, how? And yeah, definitely it's going to be, um, you're going to be able to uh, watch this afterwards. And the way we're going to do that is there's an evaluation you need to fill out at the end of this presentation. And I'll give you the link at the end of this presentation. And if you fill in that, you can put your contact details and you can get a, uh, a link to this recording when it's uploaded. So that, that it should be uploaded in the next 24 to 48 hours. Um, 
and also the evaluation is super important because it gives, uh, you know, you can put feedback on my teaching style, et cetera, if you enjoy the presentation. Um, but especially um, we've, got, we've had, we've been so fortunate to have UBS sponsor us for this revision series. That's why we can bring it to you guys for free. Um, and so if we have good reviews then hopefully we can give you more and more good content. All right. So we're going to be moving on with uh, the area of study being vectors. We're going to be talking about something called vector resolutions or uh, projections. You might have heard of them. Um, we're going to be learning about linear. I mean, we're going to be touching a little bit on linear independence or linear dependence. And finally, we're going to be talking about vector calculus. Um, so that's, you know, differentiating. Uh, we're looking at vector functions rather, and then we're going to look at differentiating them and what they can tell us about. Um, well, in this, uh, in this uh, presentation, we're going to see what they can tell us about arc length. Cool. So let's talk about vector projections and resolutions. So let's, you know, first things first, we need to get our vector resolutions correct. This is something that a lot of people have trouble with. And there is a million formulas out there. And I think that's the reason why there's a lot of formulas you need to know. There's a lot of names for the same thing, but the thing, the main thing you just need to know is the vector resolute of A in the direction of B is this. A dot B on B dot B, B. That's all you need to remember regarding vector projections. Um, that's it. No other, not sure what, what happened here. No other, no, no other formulas, I think. Cool. So that's all you have to remember. And I mean, let's, let's just immediately try to apply that. We know that when you want to find out what's the res, uh, vector resolute of A in the direction of B, and let's look at the, the question. We've, we've got given A, we've got given B and C. Um, cool. So obviously we don't need C for this first part, so let's just delete it. Um, don't worry about this whole other part. We just want to know the re vector resolute of A in the direction of B. We can address that as U. And we can write that's just a dot b on b dot b b. Easy as that. It's worth two marks. We already got one mark. Now a dot b, we can see that's just going to be three. And now it'd be embarrassing if I got this wrong. Three minus ten minus six on one plus four plus nine. Um, I'm hoping that you know how to do your dot products. And then we can just write B at the front. So that's just going to be I minus 2J plus 3K. And so we can just evaluate this arithmetic to get uh, negative 13 on 14. Did I get that right? Yep, negative 16, negative 13 on 14. I mean, I study pure maths, but I still can't do this, just these easy add, adding and subtracting. Um, and then we've got this I minus 2J plus 3K. All right, perfect. So we're done. It's as easy as that. Try not to get, comp uh, try not to get too confused when it comes to this kind of stuff. All righty. Now let's move on to lecture, uh, linear independence. As I said, I'm skipping a lot of topics. So I'm not really doing much proof stuff, even though you don't need to know too much proof stuff. I'm not talking about like perpendicular vectors or anything like that, but vector independence is something that I, I find that comes up on a lot of the exam. So I thought i plus j in terms of those other vectors. So i plus j is half the 2i vector. So this corresponds to this one. And then it's just going to be negative 1, the negative j vector. So what we can say is one of the vectors, I mean, this is more fancy vocabulary, but one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other co uh, vectors. So since we can write one of the vectors in terms of the other vectors, we can say it's not linearly independent. Or alternatively, you could say it's linearly dependent. Now, the way um, 
so this is kind of theoretical. I mean, I guess you can understand the theory, but how do we do this in practice? How can we find, I mean, we have three vectors and we have a constant here, D, and we want to find what D is for them to be linearly dependent. And I'm going to show you a process that you can do to find this. So what you want to do is you want to look at all the I components. So let me just highlight them, all the I components, all the J components, and all the K components. And you want to look at them separately. So, okay. So let's start with the green components. And remember, we want to make one vector up using the others. So let's say that 2x minus 2y is equal to negative 6. So 2, two multiplied by that first vector, negative 2, sorry, some constant multiplied by negative 2. Uh, maybe, I could, maybe it's better to write this as the i. We're looking at i's. So negative, uh, 2x minus 2y, we want that to equal negative 6. Now, um, don't really have time to talk about why this is the case, but um, if you do, I mean, I guess you can ask the question on Mentimeter, but this is, I'm just going to show you kind of the process of how to do it. So we look at the i components and we do this kind of equality. Next, we can manipulate the i components a little bit to make it a bit nicer. This just means x minus y is equal to negative 3. Again, we can write that this means that x is equal to y minus 3. Next, let's look at the, the yellow components, the, or the j components rather. So let's look at j. We get this negative 3x plus 4y is equal to d. Sorry, equal to 2. My bad. Negative 3x plus 4y is equal to 2. Um, now we can manipulate this a little bit because we, can, we know what x is. So we can just plug that in. So negative 3, y minus 3 plus 4y is equal to negative 3. And then we can just expand the brackets. Negative 3y plus 9 plus 4y is equal to negative 3. And then hopefully, with a little bit of rearranging, you can see that, well, this 4y plus negative 3y, that just becomes y. And if we put 9 um, to the other side, um, sorry, negative 3, y minus 3. Let me see if I just made an arithmetic mistake. Um, negative 3x plus 4y is equal to 2. Negative 3, y minus 3. So we get this negative 3y, perfect. Negative 3 multiplied by negative 3 is just 9. Okay. And then we get this 4y. Negative 3, cool. If I've made an arithmetic mistake, please please tell me now. I don't think so. Jalen? Um, we have a question uh, on Mentimeter. Um, for the vector resolutes, if we wanted to find B in the direction of A, would we just switch the variables in the formula, or is it the same? Yeah, just switch the variables in the formula, yeah. that's the, Thank you, Jamin, thank you very much, yeah. Just switch the variables in the formula. Now, i got a thing, I think it's 2, not maybe 3. What did I, oh, yeah, sorry, I got a bit mixed up, yep. Thanks so much, so this is 2. And this is two. And so, cool, perfect. I, I know I made a mistake. Um, thank you, um, Hoi. And so this just means that y is equal to negative seven. Perfect. Um, well, yeah, not two y is equal to negative seven, but y is equal to negative seven. This should be the case. Yeah. Um, and so this just implies that x is equal to four. Um, sorry, x is equal to y minus 3. Let's just do that. Negative 7 minus 3 is equal to negative 10. Cool. Um, all right. Now, let's look at, finally, the j components. So if we look at the, j, um, the k components, so if we look at the k components, we've already found out what x is and we already found out what y is. And now we need to just kind of bring it all together. So we got this 4k, sorry, <laughs> let's look at the first one. Um, we've got this 4x, if we look here, minus 8y, and that's going to be equal to d. And now 
all we have to do is plug in what our x is, plug in what our y is, and then we find out what d is. So d is equal to 4x minus 8y, which is equal to 4. What was x? Negative 10. What was y? Um, negative 7. Do a little bit of arithmetic. I've got a um, pre-prepared this arithmetic um, and say so this is just 16. Now if you wanted to find something being linearly independent then we can put this as a cross but um, we're not doing that so yeah. Now I noticed that uh, there are a couple of questions popping up on uh, Mentimeter. Uh, we'll address those uh, soon. Um, cool. Let's go through the last uh, vector example. So we will end um, our discussion, oh, should say our, sorry. English is not my strong suit. <laughs> we will end our discussion on vectors with the notion of vector calculus. And this is really the study of vector functions and their rates of change. So we might look at something like r of t is equal to, um, r of t is equal to two plus ti plus four t squared minus one j. You know, something like that. The beauty of vector functions is to find, um, oh, sorry, is to, sorry, get rid of that, is to use calculus on a vector function, we can just restrict our scope to the individual i, j, and k components. And so let's just jump into a difficult example. Now, um, what I need to, what I just want to uh, say is that, um, is that, what I mean by we can just use calculus to the individual components is if we want to find r dash of t, we can just say that's just equal to 2i plus 8tj. Um, sorry, <laughs> can't do that right. i plus 8tj. Um, hopefully, I mean, hopefully you've seen all this before. So let's um, jump back into one note. Now, the really interesting thing about this question, or the funny thing, or I don't know how funny you can call it, is um, I had it on my exam. So this is the 2018 exam, two years ago. Um, and this is one, the one I did. And I remember getting it and I was like, oh my God, arc sine and vector function and square root of the square. It's like so much overwhelming. Um, but I think we can do this. Um, it's not too, too hard. So let's have a try. We've got this r dash of t is equal to. Now we just have to integrate, um, we just have to differentiate the individual components. If we see this r of t here, we can see oh, easily, this is t squared. And this we can use um, our, uh, well, the first one, we can just use the formula, one on square root of one minus t squared. But with the second one, we can just use the quotient rule. So, I mean, sorry, <laughs> the product rule. So we got, root one minus t squared plus t. And then we want to differentiate this one minus t squared. So it's just going to be negative two t, one half, and then it's just going to be one minus t squared to the power of negative a half. Let me just double check I got that right. Negative two t, one half, yep. Um, and this is going to be multiplied by that j component. Next, it's all about just making it look um, very nice. So by what I mean is we just want to put this in a suitable form. So let's just work with making this look nice. So plus one on square root of one minus T squared. Okay, we can't really do much there. Plus, well, let's have a look at here. One minus T squared. Okay, that's just one minus T squared for now. Let's see what we can do here. So this half and this two cancel out. And this negative, um, we've got this negative t and negative 2t and we've got this t. So we've got this negative 2t squared. All right, and then it's all divided by actually this square root of one minus t squared. So it's already looking quite nice. We've got this, I mean, if we put the denominators together, We've got this one minus two t squared on root um, on root one minus t squared, and then we've just got this plus one minus t squared. Now, what we want to do is put that in the fraction, 
And hopefully you can see that it just turns out to be um, equal to t squared i plus uh, 1 minus 2t squared. Sorry, did I make a mistake here? Oh, the 2's cancelled out, so the 2 shouldn't be there. 1 minus t squared on root 1 minus t squared. Thanks, Rico. Um, and then on top, to get this in time to numerator, we just have to multiply the top and the bottom by root 1 minus t squared, so we just get this plus 1 minus t squared. And all of a sudden, it, it's becoming really nice. We can write this is equal to t squared i plus 2 outside of 1 minus t squared divided by root 1 minus t squared j. And then we get this really, really nice t squared i plus 2 outside of root 1 minus t squared j. Now, I did painstakingly every single step, but I'm sure you could skip a lot of these steps. Um, I know you guys are very smart. Um, but for me, I just, just wanted to, for completeness, I just wanted to do everything. Now, what do we need to do? The question's asking, we want to find the distance d meters that the particle travels along the curve in three quarters of a second. So we found, we pretty much want to find what this is. And if it's traveling distance along a curve, we know we need to find some sort of arc length because that's the definition of what distance of a curve uh, along a curve is. So to do that, um, but let's just find, you know, well, they've got a really nice AD squared plus BT plus C. But for us, I mean, it might be worthwhile to just have a look at what that arc length square, um, arc length formula is, if, in case you guys have forgotten. But as you can see, we just have this X dash component squared, this Y dash component squared. So we just kind of found already what X dash and Y dash is. They can correspond to the I and J components. And then we want to square root it. So let's try to find what this uh, integrand is. So now we can take the square root of this T squared squared plus this two root one minus T squared and square that as well. We can see that this is just going to be the square root of um, t4 plus 4, 1 minus t squared. And all of a sudden, we get this root t4 minus 4 t squared plus 4. And hopefully, you can see that this is just a perfect square. This is just going to be t squared minus 2 all squared. Now, this is, this is a tr trick question. So hopefully you guys can get it. What is this equal to? Um, have a go in the chat. Hopefully we can get some answers. I mentioned this, um, I think, in my methods class yesterday. But what is the square root of something squared? Um, Yep, so I've got one answer, t squared minus 2. That's incorrect. Any other? I mean, you don't have to, if you, do, if you don't want to share it to the whole chat, you can just um, private message me. What is the answer to, if we square something and we find the square root, what's, what is that? Is there a plus minus? Yes, very, very important. So if we square something and we square root it, there's a plus minus. It's, or you, what, another way you can interpret it is there's a modulus. So it's actually saying modulus of t squared minus two. And the reason why is we can think of, yeah, magnitude of t squared minus two. Yeah, same thing, modulus, absolute value, all that. And the reason why is we can think well, the square root of negative 3 squared is the same as the square root of 3 squared, which is the same as 3. So we can see, I mean, we can, we can see that in the end, we had to find the modulus of whatever was inside those brackets. Good. Very astute. Very observant. Let's keep going. 
So we know that the modulus of t squared minus 2, t, oh, sorry, I wrote t, t squared minus 2, we know that that's equal to, and let's have a look, that's equal to whatever was inside here. a t squared plus b t plus c. So let's go. Oops. Now, this is, now, this is, Almost no students got this right. I think only 2% of students got this final mark. How do we find out if it, is it the modulus? I mean, is it the positive version or is it the negative version? What we need to see is that it's only defined between t being between zero and one. So if t is between zero and one, we can see that, well, it's always gonna to correspond to that negative modulus because uh, this, whatever's inside this absolute value is always going to be negative. Now, this is a very kind of high level concept and I have to try to think about what I'm saying. Since zero, I mean, t is between zero and one, then t squared minus two is always less than zero. And so we get this negative t squared plus two is equal to a t squared plus b t plus c. So, I mean, we can just equate coefficients now. a is equal to negative one, b is equal to zero, and t, uh, c, sorry, is equal to two. And after all that, we finally got culminated into our final answer. All right, so that, I mean, that kind of worked perfectly because we have, um, let's see if we're on schedule. I wanted to finish this at 12.30, yeah. Now let's see if we've got any questions on Mentimeter that we can address. And then we'll kind of finish with our little investigation into mechanics. Cool. If I'm doing the multiple choice questions last in the exam, how much time should I leave at last to do them? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So this is actually how I did my um, exam. I always put multiple choice last, but um, Jaman, uh, Jamin and Boswell might have like different um, experiences. I usually left, um, I think, I think you want to think about you know, multiple choice being one minute. So I think I might have left half an hour or 20 minutes, something like, maybe half an hour. Uh, do you have any advice, Boswell? Do you know what I mean? Um, did you do this? <laughs> for me, I normally did them first. Yeah. And if I couldn't, if the last ones were really hard, I would just, um, mark it and then come back to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can't finish it in a minute or two. Oh, no, fair enough. What's that? Yeah, pretty much the same. I usually do them at the start, but if I can't do it, I just mark it and come back to it. Yeah. But I, like, if I can't do it, I usually just uh, take a guess because mm -hmm. you might as well take the chance of getting a mark. Yeah, that, but, that's a good point. You never yeah. want to leave it. I mean, yeah. usually you know if there's one or two that it can't be right. So it's usually yeah. a third chance or a half chance of getting it right. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, but uh, usually for me, um, I'm not sure about the uh, VCE exams, but for me um, in uni, usually I leave like a minute or two per multiple choice question that I can't do. And I always come back to it at the end. Yeah. No, thanks, Bo, as well. Yeah, um, I think the moral is kind of like, um, you want to have a try, um, If but if you can't do it in 20 or 30 seconds, you can always come back to it at the end. So leave your time at the end. Um, cool. And the last question for vector resolution. Oh, cool. This is the, uh, a question that uh, I addressed earlier. Perfect. We got half an hour left. We're almost finished our mathematical endeavor into... Uh, Specialist mathematics, very shallow endeavor because it's only three hours, but yeah, cool. Um, last things we'll cover, differential equations, differential equations, vectors, we've done this, we've done this, mechanics. And so we don't really have much time into mechanics and I'm only gonna explain something called the resolution of forces now. You're supposed to know your dynamics and kinematics and all that kind of stuff, but yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, sorry, my, yeah, cool. Um, cool, so what do we need to know? We'll conclude today's presentation with just a brief discussion of the resolution of forces. The main formulae that we need to know are F net is equal to zero if the system is equilibrium and our weight force is going to be equal to mg. However, some other useful formulae in the, for, in the course include, of course, this F net is equal to ma, and we sometimes it's really uh, useful to know our sign rule. So this may be something we haven't looked at in a very long time, but nevertheless, um, it's important. Uh, so yeah, we're just going to do a question, and then uh, what we go, well, after this question, um, technically my presentation in terms of the content is concluded, but we're gonna go through the study design. And especially if you have any questions at all regarding to SPESH, please, please send them in to Mentimeter and I'll try to address, we can have a long time talking about questions. Um, that's totally okay. So anytime, like you wanna ask anything about uh, specialists, anything about math at uni maybe, or maybe about opportunities or anything like that, if you feel like you're struggling in terms of SACs, et cetera, please um, send them in and then, yeah, we can have a good discussion. So let's have a look at this question. This was from the sample exam, question five. Oops. Alrighty. Now a flower pot of mass M kilograms is held in equilibrium by two tight ropes, or two light ropes rather both of which are connected to a ceiling. The first rope makes an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical and has tension T1. And the second rope makes an angle of 60 degrees to the vertical and has tension T2. The first thing I do always when I'm looking at these types of questions is I wanna label all the forces. So first I've got this MG here. Second, I've got this T2. And third, I've got this T1. And the second thing I wanna do is I wanna match the angles up so how I'm usually interpreting them on the Cartesian plane. So instead of this 30 degrees here, it doesn't really help me, but this 60 degrees here, super useful. And again, that 60 degrees up there doesn't help me, but this 30 degrees helps me. The reason why I, I want to do that, um, I think it's pretty obvious why I want to do that, but um, the reason why that works, hopefully you know uh, the angles in the triangle are up to 180 degrees, so we can work through it that way. Cool. Um, the first question is to show that T2 is equal to T1 on root 3. All I want to do is resolve these forces horizontally. And again, let me just show that um, it is held in equilibrium. So I can assume this F net is equal to zero. So if I resolve horizontally, I can see on that left-hand side, I've got this T1 cosine 60. And on that right-hand side, I've got this T2 cosine 30. And now it just becomes a matter of rearranging and exact values. T1, cosine 60. Um, sometimes I have trouble with, uh, with degrees, but that should be one half is equal to T2. Now cosine 30, that's just going to be root three on two. And we just have to solve for T2. Hopefully we can just write there for T2 is equal to T1 on root three. That was just to show that question, only worth one mark. So it makes sense why it didn't take us very long. The second question, this is a bit of a more nuanced question. It's worth three marks. And it's saying the first rope is strong, but the second rope will break if the tension in it exceeds 98 Newtons. Find the maximum value of M for which the flower pot will remain in equilibrium. So since we're working with M, already I'm thinking, oh, okay, I have to resolve vertically somehow. So let me do that. I can say that mg, that's the only thing that's acting down. And we can see that, well, we've got this t1 sine 60, and we've got this t2 sine 30. So t1 sine 60 plus t2 sine 30. Now we can just plug in our exact values. Sine 60 is just root three on two. And sine 30 is a half. But actually, we're only thinking about the second rope. And that's why the question um, wanted us to find this tension in the second with respect to the tension in the first. Um, and so, uh, I mean, they wanted to link us somehow. 
but we're only concerned with the second row. So since, uh, I'm just going to write a little note here, since T2 is equal to T1 on root 3, this just means that T1 is equal to T2 root 3. We're only concerned with the second row. So all everything in my formula, I want to be, well, in terms of the second row. So I've got this mg is equal to T1. Instead of T1, I'm just going to write T2 root 3, multiplied by root 3 on 2, plus T2, multiplied by half. And this is really nice, because this root 3 and this root 3 come together to get just 3 on 2, and then we just got this half. So hopefully it's easy to see that this mg is actually equal to 2t2. All right. And they're saying we want to find the maximum value of m. So we have to have m as the subject somehow. So we've got this m is equal to 2t2 on g. And instead of writing just g as g, let's write it as 9.8. And we know that the biggest it can be is 98 newtons. Well, well, yeah, the biggest it can be is 98 newtons. So the upper bound, we know this whole thing is going to be less than or equal to 2 multiplied by 98 newtons, because that's the biggest thing that T2 can be, divided by 9.8. But now we get something really interesting. We've got this 98 at the top and 9.8 at the bottom. What we can do is times the top and the bottom by 10. And so this just becomes 98. The 98s cancel out. And this upper bound for uh, m, which is what we need to define, this maximum value of m, this turns out to be a nice 20 uh, kilograms. And that, you know, to be fair, is only worth three marks. I mean, to that, it's worth three marks, but it's not that much kind of working out. So, yeah, just make sure you understand what we're working with. As I said, I, I try not to work on intuition. I try to just look at, well, okay, I just want the second row. That's all I'm thinking about. I'm looking at maximum values of M. Okay, I'm going to solve for M. And then I just want to find an upper bound because that's what maximum value means, the highest it can be. All right, 1240. Now, this took me, this section took quicker than I expected. Now, I'm going to just check the questions. And if we have questions, we can keep answering those. Um, and if we don't, I guess um, we can look at the B-card study design and we can also look at that uh, partial fractions question that we missed. So let's have a look if there's any questions. Cool, we're, we're getting questions, thanks. Um, do you enjoy uni more or high school? Uh, let's, maybe let's start off with the volunteers. What do you reckon, Jamin? Um, I, I think the short answer is I enjoy uni more, but um, the long answer would be that um, actually high school is a really, really great time in your life and you'll look back on it fondly because you get to spend time with your friends almost every day at school and you don't get that in uni. It's really hard to get that in uni and there are very few people who do actually end up being able to see their friends as frequently because everyone's doing their own courses and you don't match up your times and the uni co cohort is huge. We have like over 50k students at um, UNSW and you, every term you meet new friends and it's really hard to keep friends but in a way uni you get to choose the course that you really enjoy and you get to learn and um, basically continue on and you don't have to do all the different courses and you can focus on one. And I think that's, that's um, why I'm, I enjoy it because I really enjoy my course right now. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. What about you, Fazza? Uh Yeah. So um, it's kind of like a trade off, I think with like uni, you get more freedom yeah. in terms of like what you want to study, but also, like you need, as Jami says, like lots and lots of people that you can sort of hang out with and make friends. But high school, it's also like less stress. Uh, you have more time on your hands as opposed to uni. So, uh, but personally, I enjoy uni more. Yeah, no, um, 
Yeah, that's not to say that uh, high school is not stressful because I know a lot of you guys are students, uh, and, you know, your exam soon, you're stressed. But yeah, I mean, I, I would, I really like uni. I like uni way more, to be honest. Like, uh, it, I feel just, you know, very independent. I can study what I want. I don't have to read any English texts that I don't want to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really like it. And I also think, um, I, I definitely think what German said about um, friendships and stuff like that is... Um, so true. It's a bit harder because you're not in the same classes every day um, to keep up with your friends, especially if they're in different courses. You really have to make time for them. Um, and everyone's operating on different schedules, people at work, etc. So sometimes it's quite hard for to keep up with your friends. But um, especially now in COVID times, it's even harder. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I would I think we're all kind of saying we really enjoy uni a lot. <laughs> Yeah, almost everyone I know enjoys uni more as well. Okay, yeah, cool. Yeah, same, same <laughs> with me. Um, yeah. How many practice exams do you recommend to do for special math? Yeah. Um, so, um, Boswell and German, you didn't do VCE, did you? No, we did the New South Wales equivalent. Right, yeah. Um, but you would have done practice exams and stuff like that too, right? Yeah. 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 Um, do you want to maybe explain, maybe what was your study process leading, maybe two weeks leading up to the exam or maybe a month leading up to the exam? Um, if you remember, so, maybe a while ago. So um, I took the, the New South Wales equivalent of specialist maths, which is... Um, extension to maths in New South Wales and um, for me I tried to do as many past papers as I could. You start, um, so basically I started off in the early 2000s and then I tried to work my way all the way up to like 20, 2017, 2018. So I did the exam in 2018. Oh. Um, and so, uh, and if you find out you don't have enough time for that, then you just skip a couple of years, but you keep going and you try and work it up because you, what you realize is, well, actually, I'm not sure about your exams, but um, for us, the, you can see that some questions repeat over the years, yeah, but so, in different same, ways. Same. Yeah. So if you start off in the earlier years, there's a higher chance of you being able to do the later years better. So it's almost a process of improvement over the over time as well as, over the past papers. So it's better to start off. Well, I, for me, it was better to start off in the earlier years of the past papers. Yeah. And try and... Um, my goal was to do three a day. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that that's, really that's a bit hard. intense, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really... <laughs> Wait, how long are your exams? Um, the actual exams? Uh, one, we have two exams yeah. for each sub, like for maths, and one of them's about one hour, one of them's like two and a half hours. Oh, what? That's really short. How long are you Our exam was three hours. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, our exam was three hours for extension, too. So it was really, so I did, yeah, that was, it was quite intense. And <laughs> normally at the beginning, you can't, well, for me, I couldn't finish it in the three hours time. Mm -hmm. So you keep going. But then you slowly get better and, yeah. That gives you more confidence as well. So I highly recommend you do as many as you can. Yeah, past papers, definitely. Pass up? Uh, yeah, so um, I did like the same subject, which is the specialist equivalent in New South Wales. Um, in terms of past papers, I didn't do as probably as much as uh, Jamin, but I still did like quite a bit, like at least like 20 in total. Um, just I looked at the past ones, like the past official ones. Also, we had like something called like trials, which is yeah. I'm not sure if you guys have it. No, we we do it. Yeah, yeah. So we had trials, and then we uh, like my school was fortunate enough to obtain copies from other schools. So we I, I practiced on other schools. Um, so what I normally did, my technique was uh, I never. It like started off by doing an entire exam, like f at, at the first go. I always uh, just picked out like one or two questions from the exam, and 
I would sort of do it, but with my notes. And then once I got the hang hang of it, I did it without the notes and then try to like improve my sort of marks, like see, see if I can like do the questions without my notes. And then once I got the hang of that, then I would start doing the, uh, the whole exam by itself just to get a feel for the timing. But, yeah, no, yeah. I, I, I definitely did the, the same thing. Um, I know a lot of different classes will have different um, advice <laughs> regarding like, do you do under time conditions straight away or do you do it without notes? So, but I definitely think, um, you know, when you're first starting out, you're not very comfortable with a lot of the concepts. Just have your notes on hand. You don't have to rush and do it under time conditions. Um, you know, it's just about improving and making sure you're comfortable um, especially with the patterns, because you'll see that, you know, it, maybe question one is usually around the same question every mm -hmm. time, question two. Yeah, cool, thanks. Let's move on to the next question. Oh, I didn't answer the question for myself, but uh, yeah, I did the same thing. I think practice papers are so important. I think that's really the only thing you need to study, especially at this stage. Um, yeah, uh, in terms of how many I did, I don't remember, but I did the same thing, I like, like, I did all of them after like 2005, seven, eight, I don't know. Yeah. Um, actually, one thing I would recommend um, is like, I definitely think that doing the official exams, past exams are much more beneficial than doing the unofficial exams made by like other companies. Um, because sometimes the other companies make it really, really hard, like unnecessarily hard or like just make them weird. So try to just stick to the VCAR official one. Um, did you completely finish your specialist and methods exams? Uh, yes. And I'm guessing Jiamin and Boswell also yes. Uh, well, like... I don't think I finished mine. It was okay. all so yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think uh, we've, I've, I'm not sure if methods is like, is it the sort of easier one or... It's the like one in the middle. Oh, okay. It's, so yeah. I assume that's like the extension one equivalent in New South Wales. But yeah, I managed to finish like the methods equivalent, but not the yeah. specialist because for me or for my exam, the last question was like, like one of the really, really hard questions that yeah. like one or 2% people who could get it. So yeah, uh, yeah, don't feel bad if you can't completely finish it. Um, probably like most, the majority of people are in the same boat as you. Yeah, for sure. And when also, just to be a bit more nuanced, when I say finish, I mean, like, I've tried to attempt every question. Yeah. Sometimes I, I, I get to a solution, I'm like, this definitely is wrong. But it's about trying everything. Um, you know, like uh, Boswell said before, you don't, or I don't know if it was Boswell or German, but like, in terms of multiple choice, you don't want to leave anything blank, you could get it right. So you may as well uh, have a try. I think that's like, my t exam technique as well is to like, at least show an attempt because you might as well get like some partial marks then yeah. get nothing at all. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. Even if you just write a formula, you might get a mark. Yeah. Cool. Is it just me or, but I, f I feel like the exams got harder over the years. <laughs> so this is probably something specific to VCE, um, but maybe they gotten harder. Uh, also the study design has changed and everything. Um, yeah, um, not really sure, but maybe. Uh, but even if the, the thing is, when it comes to, I'm not sure how it worked in New South Wales, but how it works in BC is your exams are like, like it doesn't necessarily matter how hard the exams, but it matters like how well you do relative to the other people that sat the exam. And so like, um, so, I mean, if everyone's finding it hard, then the, the scaling will um, kind of, make it so that you'll still get a good mark. Um, so yeah, you don't have to stress about that. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so we've got, um, we've got no more questions from, from the audience. Cool, so we answered all your questions. Um, so there's a couple more things that I wanted to go through. So one thing is I wanna talk about the VCAR study design for just a little bit, but before we do that, um, just so we have time, um, could you all uh, fill out this evaluation? So we need to do this evaluation every for every subject um, you come to the revision series in for Skyline. Um, 
And we need these results to refine the subjects we offer, but also to send you a link to the recording. This should not take more than a few minutes. You just have to say your name, um, your contact details, maybe some things about how I presented, et cetera. So if you could do this, um, I'm gonna, you know, uh, maybe give you four or five minutes to do this. I'll come back at maybe 12.55, so about three minutes. And if you could just, um, yeah, if you could fill this out, it's very, very important. So you can get the link, the recording and stuff like that. And yeah, if you could maybe just message in the chat done when you've done it, then I can know, give a gauge of um, how long more to give you guys. So let's just work on this for a couple more minutes. And then, yeah, then we'll come back to the uh, talking about BCAR study design and then we'll conclude today's session. Okay, see you at 12.55. Alrighty, so it's 12.55. I've gotten one done so far. Maybe I'll give it one more minute. Um, cool, two duns, happy with that. Ah, thank you. Everyone's kind of saying done now. Cool. Um, alrighty. Easy, I really appreciate that. It makes us, uh, lets us do more presentations like this in the future. Um, cool, so if we can, Oh, I just want to keep these. When we would, would we receive the uh, recording? That's a really good question. We're aiming for around 24 to 48 hours um, after the session. But um, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, that's what we're kind of aiming for. Now, let's, uh, sorry, not look at that. Let's look at the VCAR study design. So please note, oh, I should write note, not not. Please note that today was not a complete overview of everything you must know to ACE the exam. So I've tried my best to tackle the most important and fundamental things that you need to know, but there's no way I could condense two years of specialist mathematics into only, you know, three hours. For the full rundown on everything you expected to know for the exam, so please go to the VCARS Study Design website. And it's especially important to go this year because it's been amended so much. So let's have a look at um, the study design. Let me just copy this link. Oh, rather, let me just... We can just Google it. So VCAR methods. Sorry, this is specialist, isn't it? VCAR specialist. We can look at specialist mathematics. And if you were at my methods, you would have seen me do the exact same thing. We can look at um, the study design. Let's click there. And we can just look at this. The just the study design for 2020 only. If you scroll down, you can just click on the title that says specialist mathematics 34. And we can see that anytime you see a red crossed out section or a yellow section, that means we've got kind of, we've appended, they've appended a lot of things. Um, they've changed something, sorry. Um, so if we look at functions and graphs, that hasn't changed. So know everything about functions and graphs. Algebra hasn't changed either. Calculus hasn't changed. Vectors hasn't changed. Mechanics hasn't changed, but probability and statistics totally out of the course. So this is a very, uh, this is a bit different compared to methods where we had some stuff, um, we still have to know some probability and stuff like that for methods. But it's really, really important that, I mean, look at probability and statistics. It was such a big chunk, but you don't need to know any of that. So, um, so don't get confused when you're doing past papers um, that we have like maybe some probability stuff. You don't need to know that. That's all I wanted to share for you, with you guys because I just think it's important. I've gotten a lot of questions in, um, in my work at ATAR notes and stuff like that regarding what do I need to know for the exam. It's just really important that you just double check what it is. Um, and yeah, uh, cool. So let me just go back to the PowerPoint. Just have this thank you slide. Yeah, thank you guys so, so much for attending um, the Skyline Exam Revision Series in partnership with UBS. I just wanna say a big thank you to Boswell and Jiamin for helping out, as well as um, Andrew and Jane for helping set up this whole thing. Um, yeah, uh, I hope this, I mean, I'm not doing any more um, 
sessions, but you should please go to the other sessions that are on uh, later today or on Friday. Um, yeah, all right. Um, thank you all for attending. I'll see you guys when I see you. Um, cool, bye.